Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And today, ah, uh, this is a fascinating case. And I think one of the most peculiar ones I've ever run into. It is the case of Judy Smith, the wife who was in, supposedly in Philadelphia with her husband and then vanished and ended up found murdered in the mountains of North Carolina, which seems kind of odd. So <laughs> we're going to delve into that. And I've got a lot of points to make that I haven't seen made other places um, where I've heard people tell the story and look at the psychology and stuff like that. But some of the evidence that actually exists in this case, which tells us something I haven't found pointed out. So stay around because I'm going to give a slightly different viewpoint than you might have heard before. So let me say hello to everybody in the chat room. And oh, good. Very clear video and audio. Thank you, Lisa S. <laughs> so who's here? Gretchen's here. Annika's here. Um, Lisa S. is here. Joe is here. Welcome back, Joe, after a wonderful uh, call in that you did. Uh, it was just so much fun. And it's always like already like 600 views of that because and people love it. Uh, Carrie's here. Beth is here. Carolina is here. And Carolina, <laughs> and Carolina is from North Carolina. So this is going to be interesting. I'm going to get your input on this, especially. Uh, she says, I'm here from North Carolina where Judy ended up. I cannot figure out why she came here, why she left her husband. I hope Pat can shed some light based on evidence. Yeah, so do I, but we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> um, who else is here? Doreen is here. Uh, Martin is here. Hey, Martin. Florence is here. Carrie's here. Did I already say that? Beth, Beth did already say that. I'm, I'm now I'm going backwards and I'm not sure if I'm saying, repeating everybody's name. Uh, Lisa N is here as well from New Zealand. And uh, Christine is here from, from uh, Minneapolis. And if I missed you, I'm really sorry. And if you come in, I'll try to note you when you come in. And Molly's here. I don't know. Okay. Just before I get started, um, I would like to point out that uh, the the wonderful um, people here in the chat room are here because they have joined Patreon uh, for five bucks a month. You can support this channel. You can come to at least eight live shows and participate in the call-ins and in the chat rooms for the case shows and in the hangouts. So I think it's worth five bucks a month and it supports the channel. But please, if you can't do that, please at least subscribe to the channel, like this video, hit the bell so you can get notified and share in true crime groups. You can buy a book to support the channel and you can hit the little dollar sign below and do a one-time donation. Okay, that's that. Let's get to the story. All right. So this is fascinating. Now, what I want to do first, whoa, really? I'm sorry. I just have to check this out. Annika says she's also in Minneapolis in Seward. I lived in White Bear Lake for four years, so um, I have a little little bit of my heart over there in Minnesota. So, okay, Judy Smith. What If you have never heard about this case, I'm going to do the little quick Wikipedia rundown. And then I'm, there's actually really a fair good amount. Hold it. I'm, incoherent. <laughs> I'm, I'm knocking over my soda. <laughs> I just wanted to warm you up to the way I do my shows, which is not very well prepared. No, I'm kidding. Um, just slightly incoherent. All right, here we go. The killing of Judy Smith. Uh, and what I wanted to say was I'm going to do a small bit and then I'm going to go back over all these details of what they say they found as far as evidence goes, what her movements were and what they're missing, in my opinion. All right. Oh, look at that. Really? That White Bear, oh, the White Bear Lake Community College. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so here we go. Killing of Judy Smith. On September 7th, 1997, hunters in North Carolina's Pisgah National Forest found human bones, clothing, and some other items scattered in the woods near a campground. By the way, I do remember the word campground. The remains, most of which were centered around a shallow grave, were identified as belonging to a woman between the ages of 40 and 55 with a serious, seriously, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> oh, it's going to be a great day, um, seriously arthritic knee. And this is also very important because there are many people who say, oh, I don't think that was Judy Smith at all. And that's why, hey, it's crazy. She was supposed to be, she wasn't supposed to be in Philadelphia and she ends up nine hours away by a car in the mountains of North Carolina. 
that's not Judy Smith. That's some other lady who was murdered up there. And But the arthritic knee plays a part in this, in both the identification and in some people's um, opinions of why she would be there in the first place, hiking in the mountains with a seriously arthritic knee. Okay. But she did have one. Um, due to holes and cuts on her bra and similar cutting marks on the bones, investigators ruled that unidentified, the unidentified decedent at that time had been stabbed to death. Now, let's get rid of the first problem here where people think it's not Judy Smith. And to be fair, folks, I thought that's a possibility that it wasn't her at all. And we've been you know, running around in circles trying to connect, you know, what happened in Philadelphia with her husband and how she ended up in North Carolina. What if she never was in North Carolina? What if that's total bunk? It's not Judy Smith. That's not her body. Something happened up either at home in Boston, where they started from, or in Philadelphia. And this is all, you know, wasting our time. Let me put that to rest right now. Dental records. And she had a lot of dental work. Dental records and the arthritic knee was how they identified her as Judy Smith. So, and I, and there's a lot of sightings as well, but the important thing is, because I don't trust sightings as far as I can throw them, but she was the right height and she was, oh, oh I think she was five foot three. I think that's what she was. Um, I'm trying to find where it is. I think she was like, she's short. Um, and of course it was just bone. So you're not going to see how much weight she had. Um, so, but you, you see the height. Uh, but you can measure stuff. Their bones weren't all together, so they were kind of scattered because animals had kind of chewed on them. Um, but she, there was some clothing there, so the clothing would tell you something about her um, her proportions of the body. And then the arthritic knee shows up, and I check this out because just because someone says they have an arthritic knee, you know, it doesn't really mean they do. Even if they tell people they do, you would have to have some proof that you truly had an arthritic knee. Um, as opposed to some other issue going on with some, you know, ACL or some other, you know, meniscus thing going on with your knee or water around the knee, all kinds of things it could be that cause you some pain, but it's not really a seriously arthritic knee. However, you can actually see seriously arthritic knees on x-rays. And I checked that out because one thing you want to do when you're investigating or profiling is not assume something when you're I really don't know, you know, and I really didn't know. So I'm like, let me check that out. So they were able to identify that she had a, this, the, the decedent had a seriously arthritic left knee, which is interesting. Now that doesn't mean because since she's in her fifties, it couldn't be another 50 year old woman with a seriously arthritic knee. However, then she had all the dental work and dental work is like fingerprints. It's great stuff. Um, here's how that works. So if you've had very little dental work, it's, it's, it's much harder. But once you've had serious dental work, you can see all the, the additions to your teeth, uh, whether they be uh, fillings or whether they be some kind of bridges or all these kind of things have been done to you. Um, and you, first of all, they're going to know how many teeth there are. Um, now, what you can't, what can't happen is um, she could have gone away and gotten more work done for example. So you could have, if you were looking at uh, two x-rays, you could say, well, this x-ray only has, let's say, I don't know, so many fillings and this ray x-ray has three more. So it's not the same person. That's not true because that could have been added. However, you can't go the other direction. So if work has been, if you had the um, original work there and then when you find the, the dead person, that work isn't even there. You can't take it away. So I'm pretty sure that when they looked at these two, because they, they had so many different interesting exactness, it's, it's, you know, nobody gets their, nobody's teeth look the same. Nobody's work is the same. So unless it's very, it would be very rare that you could have two mouths match like that. So they had the dental work, which was, and, and the arthritic knee and her height and oh, it was her. So let's get rid of that um, part of it. They found her body. It was Judy Smith. Now, what happened to Judy Smith? So now we're going to go back um, to the beginning. Um, yeah, I, I agree with this, Carrie. Sightings tend to be red herrings. And I'm going to explain why some of these sightings really might have been off the mark. Um, and this happens all the time in investigation. It's very frustrating. Um, okay, so 
let's go back to what happened to Judy Smith. Now, Judy and uh, her husband, uh, first of all, let me tell you about her because it's kind of interesting. Um, Judy Bradford, her name from her second marriage, was a home care nurse in the Boston area. She met Jeffrey Smith, a lawyer, when she cared for Smith's father for a week following the latter's throat surgery in the mid-1980s. Jeffrey later recalled Judy's devotion to his father's care using a window curtain rod to hold an IV bag um, that his father needed dripped into him in the absence of a proper holder. Jeffrey, a divorcee with a grown daughter, began dating Judy, who had also had two adult children from a previous marriage. She actually, This was actually her third marriage. First dude um, apparently disappeared <laughs> and ran off to like Sweden or something. It was very weird. Second mar marriage, uh, she had two kids and eventually divorced, and he was divorced. And I think this is important to point out that both of them had been divorced, so I don't think that these two people would... A lot of people think maybe he killed her uh, as opposed to divorcing her, but I mean, they'd done divorce before, so I'm not sure that that's a good reason. So anyway, he was also related to um, healthcare work uh, and legal stuff. But anyway, um, they got married in 1996. Now, they had actually been around together for years. They, uh, so they had a long relationship, but then finally got married in 1996. So he represented the Northeast Pharmaceutical uh, Conference, an organization of researchers and executives from New, Z New England. Eight months after their marriage, the couple planned their first trip together. I don't know about that because they were together before. So do they never take a trip together? Kind of weird. Um, maybe that pissed her off. Uh, you know, um, at two, they, he was going to attend a conference in Philadelphia from April 9th through 11th in 1997. And then the idea was she was going to join him there, do some tourist stuff while he was at the conference, which is perfectly reasonable. Now, a lot of people do that. It's like, hey, come join me. Already got the room, you know. So why don't you just have fun during the day? The stuff that I never want to do. And then in the night, we'll go, you know, we'll meet. We'll have, you know, we'll go to dinner, whatever. Um, and then afterwards, they were going to visit friends in New Buy, New Jersey. So, so far, sounds very reasonable. Um, <laughs> I want to point out what Lisa said. I think so much depends on which sightings are credible. That is true. Um, in this case, there's sightings of her in Philadelphia and actually in New Jersey and then sightings of her in North Carolina. And you point out which ones are credible. And how do you prove which ones are credible? That becomes the difficulty. All right. So now what happened? So now they're, they're, they're living in, um, they're living in Boston and they're going to Philadelphia. Let me just throw up a map. Uh, uh, some people aren't in the United States, and I want you to sort of understand the distances in this case. Let me find the first. Where's my first map? Map, where are you? Okay, it should be this one. There we go. Okay, so up at the top there, uh, where, where the top of the, the blue line is, that's that's uh, Boston. And if you go down there uh, by car, it would take you five hours, a little over five hours to get to Philadelphia. So that was one reason they flew. He was probably being paid to fly, and so he added her ticket, uh, not a highly expensive ticket to just go from, you know, uh, that was a through flight, I'm sure, back in those days, you know, so Philly to uh, Boston to Philly and back home again. So, but I want you to remember the five-hour drive time because that could have an impact on this case. So anyway, they go to Logan International Airport on April 9th to check in for their flight. Judy suddenly realized she had forgotten to bring her driver's license. New FAA regulations at the time, and those regulations had been in play for over a year and a half, uh, required that airlines verify passengers' identities before allowing them to fly. And if any of you remember, <clears throat> if you're old enough, you used to be able just to go on, get on a plane, you know, get, on, get, get, get a ticket and go. And if you couldn't go, you could just hand a ticket to your friend and say, you use the ticket. And suddenly they came up with this idea that everybody had to prove who they were before they could use a ticket and all that stuff. So things had changed. She said she forgot her, she got there and said, oh my gosh, I don't have my driver's license. This is a bone of contention with people. First of all, is the reason she didn't get on that plane was because he'd already murdered her and she was dead back in the house in Boston or someplace else, or did she really forget that? And that's why she just had to go back home and then get a later flight or did she plan plan to forget the license so she wouldn't have to board the plane with him and she could come in later? Those are three different possibilities. So what happened was 
Judy told her husband she would return to their home to get it and take a later flight. Also in the days when it was easier to get a later flight. Um, that evening, she caught up to him in the lobby of the Doubletree Hotel in Center City, Philadelphia, where the conference was being held, apologizing for her mistake and bringing flowers. Okay, I have a problem with this. Does anybody know what I have a problem with? Well, I'm going to see what the chat room folks have to say here about this. By the way, it has been proven, as far as I know, that she was on the flight. So I want to get that kind of out of the way. Um, there were people who said, there were two people at the hotel that said they saw her. One said they saw her with the flowers. Somebody else said they saw her. Somebody from the conference said they saw her. But again, those are questionable accounts, especially the guy from the conference, because did he really know what she looked like? Um, I don't know. I, I don't have the police reports. I didn't interview these people. But one person, the one guy, I guess, working for the hotel said he saw her with the flowers. But the more important thing is supposedly they'd have record of her come getting on the second flight in the evening and her luggage came with her, supposedly. Okay. Again, I can't check it because I don't have the proof in front of you, but they say she got on the flight. So she did not, not arrive in Philadelphia is what they're saying. But, mm, mm, there, okay, here we go. Uh, here's a couple of questions. Why would she buy flowers for him? Yes, I have that question. Um, and Annika says, why bring flowers to a hotel for one or two nights? Well, I'm going to answer that one. Um, some people love flowers. And in airports, uh, certain places in the world, like I know in New York City, they got like flowers on like every corner, right? Um, so picking up some flowers and saying, oh, they're pretty. and putting them in your hotel room to enjoy them while you're there. I don't have a problem with that. So I don't have a problem with the flowers uh, as far as that goes. And Lisa says, who did someone give her the flowers? I guess it's possible, but that's not kind of what I would think if she didn't want him to know about the flowers being given to her, she would have dumped those suckers. Um, that's the one that bothers me. Thank you, Doreen. It was just a mistake. No need for flowers to apologize to your husband. Yes, I think it's kind of excessive, shall we say? I mean, you're lucky if a guy, if a guy cheats on his wife, lucky she gets flowers. <laughs> you know? But here, she, she oh, I forgot my, why would she need to bring flowers as an apology? I mean, she was only five hours late. I mean, so he get, this guy is an executive. He travels all the time. So he gets there earlier at four o'clock. He goes and relaxes, has a decent time. She, she shows up, maybe has dinner by himself, but he's for a conference. So there's probably people to eat dinner with. He's probably just as happy she's not there. Does she really feel like she needs to apologize by bringing flowers? Makes you wonder what's the purpose of this excessive, oh, I'm so sorry thing. That's suspicious. I find that odd, shall we say. So anyway, let's go on to the next thing I find suspicious. The next morning, Jeffrey woke before his wife and went downstairs to get breakfast. Okay, if I were a police detective, the first thing I'm gonna ask is, your wife didn't come in late. It's not like it, uh, she was like super, super tired from some incredibly long international flight. <laughs> it was probably an hour. Um, did, you, did, did you always have a pact where, hey, if I wake up 30, no, 20 minutes before you, I just go and eat by, be, eat alone and screw you. I mean, yeah, you know, you think he would wait for her. I mean, she brought him flowers. <laughs> you could just wait a little bit. Now, was the conference in gear and he was afraid he was going to be late? There's this is a little odd, and I'd love to know what the interview was in this case. Um, so then it gets odder. Um, he returned to the room afterwards and found her awake in the shower. I hope she's awake in the shower. <laughs> no, awake and in the shower. It should be written. Um, he told her the breakfast was exceptional. Really? I'm sorry. I've never found one of those buffet breakfasts particularly exceptional, but okay, dude. Um, and that she should have it for herself. Well, I guess it's usually included anyway. So anyway, she joked in response that she should just go down as she was at the time 
naked. Ha uh ha. -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, does any did anybody say anything funny about that statement? She he says, Hey, you know, uh, why don't you go get some breakfast? And she says, Oh, I should go down naked. What do you think? This is my opinion. Sometimes when people tell a story about what happened, it has pieces of truth to it, but it's not the entire truth. Does anybody have a clue where I think the actual story might be as to what happened that morning? Anybody have an idea? Because I'm curious whether you're going to see some of the things that I think. Now, again, this, when, when you're doing this kind of thing, um, this is speculation. And have to be aware that it's speculation. But speculation based on how people's behavior tends to be and what the statement is that makes you, throws up red flags to you, is something that allows, if you're a profiler or a detective, what lead you might want to look into and what questions you might want to ask. Mm. He was with someone else. No, I don't think so. No, no. Um, odd thing after odd thing after odd thing. This is true. But does, any, does anybody have an idea what I think actually happened that morning, which would be more likely what happened that morning? Uh, so let's say, all right, he, he gets up, he wants to have breakfast. She says, I'm, I'm taking, I'm got, taking a shower. Well, I'm going to go eat. Why did, you know, I wanted to go eat. You're taking too long. And she says, what, you just want me to go down naked? Much more likely what happened, that he left her in the hotel because she was taking too long in the shower or something like that. Um, so, yes, and I think this is very possible. There was an argument somewhere in there. Um, yep, exactly. Let's see. She said, I'm not dressed. Should, we just, should I just go down naked? And he leaves. So, yes, I think there is something going on. And... There's people that say that, oh, they had a wonderful marriage. And there's some, a friend, apparently, who said not so not so much. So she goes, she's apologizing with disposed flowers, either because she's fearful of him. They say there's no violence in the marriage and they seem to be happy, but behind closed doors. Um, she's bringing flowers like she's worried about his, you know, like she's got to beg for his forgiveness or she's trying to cover up something she's going to do, one of the two. And then... Now there's this, oh, I'm just going to leave you and go have breakfast. And then she's saying strange things. Or is it just that when the morning came, he's like, I'm going to have breakfast. Well, I want to take a shower. Well, don't, screw it. You know, I'm going to go down. Oh, well, should I come down naked? Blah, 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 blah. And then that's the last he sees her. Supposedly at that point, this is what happens next. All right. Jeff, Jeffrey left for the day's first session. The night before, the couple had agreed that Judy, who was making her first trip to Philadelphia, We'll go visit the city's tourist attractions, such as Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell. By the way, I'm going there at the end of the month to Philly to see those same things. If I disappear, somebody did it to me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and then they were reunited at the hotel at the end of the day for the conference's cocktail party at 6 p.m. When Jeffrey finished moderating the last of the day's sessions, he returned to their room and Judy was not there. He assumed she had returned. And by the way, they don't have cell phones here, so that's an issue. He assumed she had returned, changed, and gone down to the party ahead of him. Perhaps had gotten confused about their plans. Okay. When he went downstairs to check on this, however, she was not there. After going back and forth between the party and the room several times, he grew concerned and informed her concierge who began calling area hospitals. Um, all right. Plausible, plausible that she, the, the, the agreement was they were going to meet for cocktails and she did not return. Clearly she did not return, that there's no question about that. Uh, so the question is, did he know she wasn't returning or did he not know she wasn't returning and became like, what the heck is going on? I think this part is, is relatively acceptable. Um, Jeffrey left the cocktail part. Oh, so, well, there are many reasons why she might have been delayed. She might have not have thought twice about helping a stranger in need. Okay, let's not overdo it here. But if she did something like that, she usually called or let, tried to let someone know. She knew where she was staying, okay? Because she took from, from the uh, 
from the airport, she had to take a taxi to the, the hotel. So it's not like she didn't know what help, hotel she was in. Uh, and I say that only because it's very possible. Somebody picked you up from the airport and said, we're staying wherever, uh, Double Tree, or you might even forget the name of the hotel. Some people just aren't very good with that. You, you know, you're being picked up and carted about. You go in the hotel, you get in your room, you kind of say, where the heck, what, what's the name of the hotel? I could see that's possible. But she was, she took a taxi to the hotel. Consequently, she knew how to, what she had the address of the hotel. She knew the hotel's name. So that she wouldn't have called and left a message at the hotel, said, leave a message for the room. I need to tell my husband I'm going to be late is odd. So there's something about that. <laughs> Don't buy anyone flowers. <laughs> no flowers when I go to Philly. No flowers when I go to Philly. All right. So now she's missing. Now they call around, you know, he doesn't know where she is. Okay, so they call the hospitals. All right, you know, um, so let's see. Oh, and then he called the step uh, children in Boston, uh, asked if they'd go to the house and check the answering machine for any messages. Nothing, nothing on the that answering machine. Um, because these are the days when you had a stupid answering machine. Uh, he also took, he paid a cab driver to slowly follow the route of the Philadelphia flash tourist bus, which Judy had told them she was planning to use. So in other words, the route that it took, he was going along the route looking for her. Now, I find all this pretty credible as far as that goes. I find it very, I, I believe she was in Philadelphia. I believe that something is kind of fishy about why she had to bring the flowers and what happened that morning. I'm thinking things aren't as good as people say they were. Then she vanishes during the daylight hours in the city on a tourist, in the tourist area. That is very unlikely, very unlikely. Um, and her husband is clearly looking for her in ways that make sense that he would have looked for her and that he went to the police, that he called the stepchildren, he, and he followed the, 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 um, that tourist bus. I have to say he looked for her. He did not kill her, by the way. This is just nonsense that he would have killed her. Um, he didn't kill her at home because she got to Philadelphia. He didn't have time to kill her in Philadelphia, even if even some people say, oh, well, he killed her in the night after, you know, somehow, uh, somehow after the first night that she got there somewhere, you know, in the evening, he killed her. He put her in, a, somehow got her in a vehicle, drove her all the way to the mountains of North Carolina, which is like, let me, let me show you the map of how far away that is. Um, okay, this is, okay, so now you're in Philadelphia up there. Going all the way down to North Carolina, to the Asheville area, you're talking nine hours and 13 minutes. No, <laughs> he did not say, let's go for a ride, honey. And he had this car nobody knew about. And he chucked her in it. And he drove her all the way to the mountains of North Carolina at three o'clock in the morning and knocked her off and somehow got all the way back to Philly to be there for the, to, to, run, the, to run the seminar thing. No, just not happening. Absolutely not happening. So guy did not kill her. So let's get that out of the way. So now, all right. So now she's gone missing and they report, he reports it to the police and they don't do too much about it. Cause you know, she's 50 some year old woman and they're like, no. and, and let's, let me talk about serial killers now here. This is during the day. Um, serial killers have grabbed people off the street during the day. And I just want to point out this very important point about serial killers. Uh, this is the picture. The picture you see here is often the picture you see of her um, with her little, I suppose, an iconic red uh, backpack. I'm going to get into the backpack issue in a minute. Now, you can tell there she's not exactly small. I mean, she kind of, you know, she's kind of chesty. So she's, she's not exactly thin, shall we say. And here is a fuller picture of her. In other words, she's overweight. Uh, I'm going to say... Uh, you know, not quite, I don't know if you want to say obese, but definitely overweight. All right. I'm sorry, but, you know, serial killers do just say, oh, look, a, a, an overweight 50-year-old tourist uh, wandering around. And now let me grab her. No. <laughs> you know, no. <laughs> they go for the young teenage girl. They go for somebody thinner, easier to grab, easier to fit into their car, uh, into their trunk, you know. No, I mean, that's just, she's not a good victim for a you know, serial killer in the middle of the day. So I want, I want you to keep the weight thing in mind because that's kind of important um, in how, what happens in people's lives, essentially. All right, so now 
she's missing. All right. The next thing that happens here is, okay, they, now they're looking for her. All right. And they, they put out this, uh, this is, and I, I have a, a crappy picture of this. Where's my crappy picture? Hold on a second. No. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Here's the crappy picture. And I want to point out something about this crappy picture. All right. This a picture on the right appears to be of her at a younger years, I think. And the, over to the left in the blurriness, you see, missing person put out by the Philadelphia Police Department. You see, she looks kind of porky on the left. And you see that red bag. Okay. The red bag. Okay. This red bag becomes extremely important because there's all these sightings in Philadelphia. Once they put this thing out about her, um, there's a there's a sighting about how, and, and I'm going to put the link to two two shows below. I'll put Trace Evidence's show on it and also Dr. Grande's because he goes into a lot of the psychological possibilities of what happened to her. There's sightings of her homeless man says that she spent the night on the bench next to him. Then there's some, there's a hotel that said there's this crazy woman essentially who was um, talking about, let's see, what, let's see if I can find that statement here. Oh, the, here, here are the possible sightings. Get, get these. All right. Some of them Jeffrey found credible. Most were in the city, but later reports came from outside the city. Right. A number of reports described a woman who matched Judy's description, but appeared to have psychological issues. Now, mind you, nobody's ever said Judy had psychological issues prior to this moment. And as I point out, it's pretty rare that suddenly in the middle of a, hey, I'm visiting Philadelphia, I'm going to go look at the Liberty Bell, and you go psychotic. Um, but anyway, uh, she was described by staff at the Society Hill Hotel. I'm not quite, I'm curious how much of a Society Hill that was. Um, as their weirdo of the week. When she stayed there between April 13th and 15th, signing in as H.K. Rich slash Collins. While there, she masturbated in front of an open window, spoke to herself in tongues, and then loudly claimed the emperor would be wiring her money when she needed to extend her stay. Okay. That's pretty crazy. Then another report mentioned a woman at the junction of Broad and Locust Street around 3 p.m. on the day Judy was last seen, describing the woman as disoriented. Now, I want to point out right here, you're in the middle of Philadelphia. You know how many disoriented people you got on the streets of Philadelphia? <laughs> Crazy people. There were other reports of a similar woman who also appeared disturbed in Penn's Landing, another neighborhood, a flash stop and a popular tourist attraction as well. But both the police and the family believe that those who saw her confused Judy with a homeless woman in the area who strongly resembled her because 50 old, uh, white 50 year old women with like short blonde hair there are a dime a dozen, you know, down the street. They are. Um, they just are. Um, so, and they're mostly overweight because they're over 50. So there you go. Um, go to any, go to, go to Walt Disney World and count, count. They all look the same. Um, so, so there's a homeless woman who strongly resembled her, so much so that even Judy's son thought the woman was his mother when he saw her from across the street. There you go. All right. However, one of the homeless man said he was shown Judy's picture and insisted he had seen her and not the other homeless woman sleeping on a bench next to him. He's a homeless man. Most of them have psychiatric and al alcohol and drug problems. I'm not believing him. All right. Um, so anyway. So this was the last time uh, anyone had identified her. Then there was this other really strange. Okay. There's a couple more strange things. Let me tell you the other strange one. Okay. Uh, sightings that seemed to be more positive identification were centered around the flash bus and its route. A hotel employee said she had asked later in the morning of April 10th where she could catch the bus nearby. A driver said he had picked her up at Front and South Street in the early afternoon and let her off near the hotel. She was also reportedly seen entering and leaving the city's Greyhound bus terminal, possibly to use the bathroom. The terminal was near Chinatown, and she loved Chinese and Thai food. However, no one at any restaurants actually remembered seeing her. Another report surfaced she had been seen shopping for dresses at Macy's at the Deptford Mall in Deptford, New Jersey, across the Delaware River. She could have gotten there, they realized, via the North, uh, New Jersey Transit Bus Route 400, which makes hourly runs to the mall from Market Street in Center City and the intersection of Broad and Cherry Streets. A salesperson and customer at Macy's gave an account of the actions of a woman who may have been Judy, saying she 
was shopping for her daughter, even though her daughter often disliked what she bought her, which rang true to the family, and giving a description that included the distinctive red backpack she carried almost everywhere, especially when traveling. As the woman left, they recalled, she had tried to get a younger woman, whom they assumed at the time was a woman's daughter, to leave with her, probably because it was the woman's daughter. All right. And uh, now that's the, these are the Philadelphia ones. Interestingly enough, when she gets to North Carolina and there's supposedly sightings over there, nobody's talking about the red backpack. This is really important. So, okay, let me stop. With, let's start with the backpack issue here. All right. I want to show you the backpack issue. Okay, let's see, here is, here I am with my, with my friend, Annie, who is sometimes here in the chat room. Here are Annie and I, oh my goodness, we both have red backpacks. As a matter of fact, this one was, uh, this, uh, I can't remember if I, uh, how did that work? I know Annie added these, these uh, um, stickers for me, the places I had been, uh, India and Mongolia, China, and she, she fancied up this backpack and, um, I think I might have actually brought backpacks for people. I because I found these cool ones there in Walmart. They're like they're they're super great because they're super thin, and you can. They're wonderful for 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 traveling uh, because they don't take up much space, um, and you can use them as day packs. And they're not you hardly feel them on you. You just take out the stuff that you've got in them, and then use them for your camera and your whatever you're carrying during the day. Um, and then you can still stuff a lot of crap in them and you can use that for traveling to the next city. So here we are with our uh, iconic red backpacks. And you can see there it is on my shoulders. Look at that. See, they're red straps, just like her red straps. Look at that. We're like, we're like little twins. If I had shorter hair, people would say that was me. Okay, so here I am with the red backpack. Now, supposedly all these people see her with a red backpack. Now remember, what, what did the Philly police put out? They put out this with her with a red backpack, that picture right here, the red backpack. So now once you implant that idea in people's heads, now people are looking for a woman with a red backpack. Uh, they may see a woman with a red backpack. They may imagine a woman with a red backpack. They may add a backpack to a woman. <laughs> you know, That's what people do. Now, when, when in North Carolina, they never talk about the red backpack. If it's so iconic and it's her in North Carolina, and people are citing her, where is the red backpack? And here's a very interesting point I want to make. All right. Just so, so what happened is when she went missing from Philadelphia, they asked the husband what she was wearing. Apparently, this is what is stated that this says she wore this one outfit to Philly. Let's say it was this outfit with a with a backpack. She wore that into Philly, and then she had her brief, her, uh, her probably her, just her small suitcase or whatever, only a two-day trip, right, or three days. So she had a suitcase. Then when she went missing, they asked him, what would she be wearing? Well, what was missing was the clothes she had worn to Philadelphia and the red backpack, right? Okay. So, and supposedly in her, he looks in her luggage and none of the clothing was missing from her luggage. Well, first of all, he's a dude. He probably has no idea what her clothing is anyway. <laughs> and secondly, he doesn't know what the hell she packed. So how would he know what was in or was not in her luggage? So that's garbage right there. What he could know is that if she wore her outfit and then now threw it on a chair, you know, you're getting, going ready for bed and you just chuck the stuff on a chair. You could hang it up in the closet. Um, stuff still in the brief uh, suitcase, but you haven't got it out yet. Uh, and then you drop your backpack. And the next morning she gets up and the same things, those are, things are missing. Then you would assume she was wearing them. They were suspicious of that, the police. They're like, well, those would be dirty clothes, essentially, that she wore. Why would you put them on for the next day? Um, and her daughter went, eh, mom does that, you know. Um, uh, and I have to tell you, there's a fun, there was a really funny, there's a comedian. And she's fantastically funny. But anyway, what, what she had said on her show was she was going out of town. So she was like, she packed like uh, three different, four different bras. And, and one of her friends goes, why are, you, why are you packing all those bras? You know, you never change them anyway. And she's like, oh, that's true. <laughs> so there, there is a truth that sometimes just because a woman wears something doesn't mean she's not going to just get up in the morning and go, hey, I'm going to be sweating all day long. I'm just going to throw the same thing on and, and go. You know, maybe it's her comfy outfit. Who knows? But that was the outfit. The outfit she arrived in was the outfit she was missing in. And her red backpack. Now, 
if you were going to disappear, there's two possibilities. Now, Dr. Grande thinks that the crazy lady <laughs> that had been seen at places being disoriented could have been A, she had bipolar stuff and she went off her nut and she started saying, doing strange things and people noticed that. It could be she faked it. In other words, he said maybe she wanted to run away for a while, but she wanted to be able to come back, you know, you have an excuse. I thought that was kind of clever. Yeah, that's a good point, Dr. Grande, that, hey, if I let people think I'm a little off, you know, something's gone wrong with me, a disassociative um, fugue state of some sort, you know, uh, that they will forgive me and won't say, well, you know, you ran away on purpose to have a good time. You just lost, you know, kind of lost of your brain cells. And we noted that in Philadelphia. So then you can be welcomed with open arms when you recover. Okay, good point. Or she faked the whole dang thing that she faked being that way, you know, so that people would not be upset with her. So yeah, all those possibilities. But now the other possibilities, you have to do these things in places where people are going to remember you. Right. So theoretically, if you wanted people to remember you acting that way, yeah, you would make sure you have your red backpack on and go ah! loudly in places so that people go, oh, that woman. Maybe or none of those sightings were anything. First of all, most of those sightings have been proven wrong. So here's the real question. What did she actually do when she what did she actually leave the room wearing? and the red backpack issue. It's also possible that she did not want to be sighted in Philadelphia, that she was slipping out of the hotel and going to disappear. And she did not want anybody to note that she went this way or that way, or somebody picked her up or whatever. Now, let me show you how that works. Oh, look, I have a iconic red backpack. <laughs> All right, so this is, this is what I'm wearing. This is what you see me with, right? Here I am, okay, now. I could leave the hotel with this on, go go into that Greyhound station if I wanted to, or whatever. Or I could not even leave the hotel with this. And look, oh, I have clothing. Uh, well, lots of clothing. Oh, shorts. I got a I got a top. Oh, I got an entire. There's another shirt. Okay. Oh, look what I have in here. It's another backpack. Okay. Now I've got this backpack. Now I don't have the red backpack, do I? I'm in totally different clothing with a completely different backpack. And now I can walk around and nobody is going to say, I saw that woman because I'm not wearing the proper clothes and I don't have the proper backpack. So this is an interesting thing I've never seen anybody bring up as if you can't do that. I mean, one thing they point out about um, Judy is that she had gone to Thailand before by, her, by herself. She was a good traveler. And I'm one of those people. I've done loan traveling by myself. I've been to many countries by myself. I've run tours to other countries. I got all the tricks, you know. I got all the tricks. And now you just saw one of them. Um, I know how to do these things because I've traveled. I know how to move things around and how to travel light and, and so on and so forth, how to buy stuff. Interestingly, let's go to, let's go to what they found in North Carolina as far as what, what was with the body. All right. Let me stop here just to let you all guys have a have a say in here before I go on to the body thing. There we go. That's suggestive. She could have ditched the backpack with her clothing somewhere in between. She could indeed have done so. Um, <laughs> she was probably saving her nice new clothes for the cocktail body, perhaps. Um, no photos of the backpack. Uh not on it. I mean, there's photos of just the, the army thing. I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, the signs weren't up in North Carolina, not at the time, but when they finally did find her body and people figured out who it could be, then they went back and interviewed people and nobody said anything about a red backpack. So interesting. Um, uh, nylon, nice and light, dry, easy. Oh, those, what my backpack is great. It's cost like, I, I think it's like eight bucks from Walmart. I, I bought like tons of them. They were great. <laughs> Christine says, I know that picture. Annie's patches. Yeah. Annie got those patches for me. It was just great. Okay. So now let's go to North Carolina. So she disappears out of Philadelphia. And I'm going to get back to the issue of the airport and the, the forgetting her ID and taking the later thing, later flight. I'm going to discuss that later. So I just want you to have two possibilities. She really was running around Philadelphia with her iconic red backpack. Some people saw her. She seemed a little off. 
and then she vanishes. And again, not a serial killer. There's no proof of how she left Philadelphia. This is very important. There's no proof she got on a bus, hitchhike. There's just nobody ever saw her anyplace after the fact. Um, I think back in the day, you may not have had an, have an ID to take a bus. So she could have theoretically used cash, got on a bus to North Carolina. Maybe. Okay. Um, oh, the great explanation, says Lisa. Everyone goes on about how she didn't have money to buy new clothes in a bag. She was found with about $170 on her. Besides what? Okay. Here's another point. Supposedly, she left uh, the hotel with 200 bucks but left $500 in the hotel. Now, first of all, who is telling us how much money they had in cash? Him. He's telling us. We don't know what how much money she actually had. And how, now he says she left $500. Maybe it was his $500. So maybe she had taken his $500. He would have been like, oh, I know what's up now. Because if you're only going to tour around Philadelphia, you don't need five, $700 in cash. You know, she did have credit cards. So it's not like she couldn't have gone into a store and bought something or paid for tickets with those credit cards. Why is everything in cash? Um, and if, if she left $500, there's a couple reasons. One is because she never planned to do any more than go around Philadelphia with her 200 bucks. Or she didn't want him to think she would take his money and run. Now, the next thing is, how do we know how much money she had on her? Again, like he wouldn't know what clothes she actually had in the, you know, how, what clothes she actually packed. You think he stood next to her and says, I think you ought to take these three outfits. You know, he's not there. To, I'm sure he's not observing his wife packing. And after she didn't get on the plane, she could have gone home and repacked and done anything she wanted. He doesn't know how much cash she had on. Now, it's possible she could have been saving up cash forever. She could have a huge amount of cash. We don't know. We don't know what's really going on with the, with the cash issue. So uh, whether she, you know, planned eventually to use her credit card, she never did use her credit cards when she left Philadelphia, um, but she got dead very quick. So it's possible she would have eventually used the credit cards. It could be that, you know, it's hard to say. She could have had more money and that was stolen. Money was found with her, but it doesn't mean that there weren't other options. We don't know any of that stuff. Um, <laughs> my husband has no idea how much money I normally have. <laughs> I've stashed cash many times. Yeah. You know, you know, if people think that, you know, everybody tells everything in a marriage is, you know, you have a very excellent marriage or somebody's fooling somebody. Okay. Let's go to the body site because this is the next really interesting and very, I think, un incorrect, um, analysis of the of the site. Meanwhile, by the way, Jeffrey hired two private investigators to look for his wife and faxed and mailed copies of his wife's missing person flyer to hospitals all over the country, asking them to look for her. So, her, so he, the information about his wife did go all over the country. Uh, okay. On September 7th, 1997, a father and son hunting for deer out of season on a hillside in the area of North Carolina's Pisgah National Forest found what appeared to be human bones near the Stony Fork picnic area along Chestnut Creek, just nine miles from Asheville. Okay. Now the bones were found, uh, the bones were been found scattered because animals had gotten there, but in the middle, the center of where the scattered bones were, were, there was a shallow grave where the majority of the skeleton remained still partially buried and clothed. Some personal effects were found in the area as well. Um, the lead investigator, put aside his convalescence from recent back surgery to scour the area for evidence. And he crushed his sciatic nerve as a result, requiring further surgery. They make a big deal of this, but her body was found on this, um, uh, I suppose it's hillside. And that this, this guy, uh, you know, this, this investigator hurt his back trying to get up the hillside because it's so steep. And therefore he couldn't have done it because he's, he's a very obese man. He couldn't have carried his wife up that side. And she was, why was she with her arthritic knee going up the steep hill? Okay, and, and, and then who would have carried her up the hill? If they killed her elsewhere, how could they have killed, carried her up the hill? Well, first of all, if you, have a, if you have a back condition, you shouldn't be work, walking on any hill. So who knows that the hill did it to him? Anyway, he could have leaned over and hurt himself. So anyway, now they uh, also discovered, let's see, um, a cutting marks on her ribs and among the clothing recovered from the scene was her bra, which also had cuts and punctures. They don't talk about a shirt being cut and punctured, which I find interesting. Which I wonder, did she, did she have a shirt on at the time 
she was cut and punctured. Now, two things are true for that, or not true, possible. One is some killer made her take her shirt off or ripped her shirt, took her shirt off and then stabbed her, or she didn't have her shirt on and she was stabbed. So, um, and that's an interesting point and I'm going to get to that. All right. So anyway, they finally identified her remains and then they started asking about what was going on. All right. Most significantly, her leg bones were still clad in jeans, thermal underwear and hiking boots. Now, these were not the clothes she was wearing when Jeffrey or any other witnesses might have seen her in Philadelphia. But they were the kind of uh, things you might have when you're hiking around Asheville in mid-April. All right. Usually you don't hike in thermals, especially if you're not you're hiking during the day because you get hot really quick. Usually if you put thermals on, it means you're staying overnight in the mountains and you don't want to get cold at night. Now, her body was found wrapped in a blanket or what was left of her body. Her skeleton was wrapped in a blanket. A blanket is not something you take hiking. Nobody seems to talk about this. When was the last time you went hiking with a blanket? I'm sorry. You don't do that. You're going to have a blanket for two reasons. One is there's a picnic site near there, and you're going to lay the blanket down and have a picnic. Secondly, you're going to stay overnight, and you bring a blanket because you want to keep warm. So you might have a tent there, and you might have sleeping bags. You might have blankets. You might have a bunch of stuff. Now, they make a big deal of it. It makes it, you know... When they talk about this case, it makes it feel like she's in the middle of so far out of out of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, like this is this is the Pisgah area. Now that does look very very wow. You know that's if you're out there, you must have been hiking for 50 miles. You know one of those you know big backpacking people. You know that's backpacked the Appalachian Trail and uh, you know and you're now in the you know North Carolina hiking the trail. No, that may be the general area, but let me show you what the reality of that is that they're not telling you. Okay, so let me go here and try to find, okay, so this is, so here we are. This is Pisgah National Forest. Um, this is the location where she was found in. It's called the Stony Fork Picnic Area. Why do they say picnic? Because you can have picnics there. Now, talk about this huge hill that somebody would have to carry her body up a hill. Um, it's a picnic area. Generally speaking, picnic areas are not that far away from roads because that's how you have a picnic. Backpackers don't usually go to picnic areas. They might stop in a picnic area if it happens to be on their trail. But generally speaking, picnic areas are in locations you can access from a road, <laughs> something fairly close before they're going to put up all this crap that you can, you know, have a big picnic in because you have to bring your picnic stuff in, you know, for a picnic. Otherwise, if you're a backpacker, you don't really have a picnic lunch. You just sit down and eat some stuff. You know, maybe a little, you might have your little, um, your little, uh, yeah, your little, what do you call it, a little burner underneath there? And you might be making a little soup or something, you know, your little rice in a pot. Uh, you might be doing some, you know, put some, <laughs> you're getting little snacks, you know, you're not having a big picnic. A picnic area is for a picnic. People come, seven, eight of them, and they have a picnic. Picnic's got to be near a road. Okay, so so here is the Piscop, the Stony Fork picnic area, and here is a bigger picture of it. Now, look at Stony Fork. Now, you see that road 151? Yep, there it is. It's a big highway going fairly near the picnic area. Uh, then there's a Stony Chest, Chestnut Creek Road, which is a smaller road going up there. Uh, and then there's all these, I'm not sure what the rest of this crap is. But anyway, all right, so it's somewhere near a road of sorts. Now, the other thing that was interesting was there was a sighting of her. Supposedly, she had gone to a, um, an, uh, a campground area where she wanted to stay overnight, and they, they they said she couldn't stay there with her car. I'll get into the car issue in a minute. But here is a place right near that location. It's called um, oh oh I'm just, oh, I'm sorry. Back to showing you where the see see where the picnic ground is. So there's a little thing off the highway there. So that's that's the way you get into it. All right. Um, Oh, by the way, it's called the Haunted Picnic Area. This is actually a picture of the picnic area. Um, and there you have a little place where you can go, you know, have your picnic under, see the picnic tables. Um, so this is an actual picnic area uh, people stay at. And some people camp at this picnic area because there actually is considered a campground as well. Uh, and it's the reason they call it creepy is because apparently a bunch, bunch of weird things happen in that area. So along with her, 
Uh, so they, and it's in disrepair apparently over the years. Um, oh, I don't put that up yet. So it's in, it's in disrepair. Um, and as far as how hard is it to get to and you can't get there? Okay, here's an interesting point here. Here's an article I found. The remains of Judith Bradford Smith, 50, of Newton, Massachusetts, uh, was found by a hunter. She disappeared April 10th uh, after being in Philadelphia. On Sunday, Smith, that's her husband, uh, visited the campsite where the remains were found. The campsite. Uh, and he agreed to an interview because he hoped it would jog somebody's memory. And he says that, um, it, if you go back up to the top here, it says, it was kind of disbelief, Smith said, of seeing for the first time the, the area where his wife's skeletal remains were found. It seems like an awful distance for someone to have forced her or to have carried her. Yes, it does. But, but husband, apparently you, you obese self, are actually at the campground. And you can see the place where your wife's remains were. So you could get there, couldn't you? That means somebody else could get there, and that means Judy could get there too. And that arthritic knee thing, okay. You can have an arthritic knee, but you know, you take some pain meds, and sometimes the arthritic knee doesn't bother you as much. She liked to hike. She'd hiked before in her life. So she could have hiked to that location. She could have gotten with that person she was with, to maybe with a car, pulled off the road, gotten to that campsite, the picnic ground, some, and maybe stayed there for the night. And something went wrong, got killed. He wrapped her in a blanket and he took her as far as he took her and buried her, probably away from the campsite so the people wouldn't find her. And he did have a blanket, so he could have dragged her. I mean, it's all kinds of things he could have done. Uh, some people say it could have been two people. Could have been, doubt it, but could have been. Um, why not? Um, but clearly, Judy got to that campsite, which is a campsite and a picnic ground on her own. She got there. Okay, and she was dressed for the weather because she had the, the long johns on. So I'm believing she was staying overnight there. Now, what else did they find there? They also found. Okay, this is something else that's interesting that they found. Okay, they found. Where's the thing? Oh, a blue and black vinyl backpack was found with a body. In it were winter clothes and eighty dollars in cash. A shirt buried nearby also had eighty-seven dollars in the pockets. The combined 167 is consistent with the $200 Jeffrey believed Judy to have on her at the time of her disappearance. The presence of the money in her wedding ring have led investigators to conclude that robbery was not the motivation for her killing. Well, probably not up, you know, when you're camping in the mountains, no. However, her red backpack was not found, nor other clothes she was wearing when last seen. Judy's family also said that an expensive pair of sunglasses found near the bones were not hers as far as they knew. Okay, so... I think the black, the blue and black backpack is what she had. That's what she exchanged for her red one. The sunglasses is what you wear when you don't want people to recognize your face. Um, the clothes, the change of clothes, because you're going someplace else, you're going to go in the mountains. All of these things lead me to believe that nobody forced Judy to put these things on. To buy. She had to either bring these things or buy these things. Um, did she bring these things from whom? So let's go back to... What was she doing? Miss, oh, she didn't have her driver's license at the airport. She was a seasoned traveler. I kind of find that hard to believe. I, I do. Uh, I think that generally speaking, you always carry your li driver's license with you. She was, it wasn't even a, it wasn't a passport, it was a driver's license. Almost always you have that in your, in your purse. Yes, you can change purses and leave it the wrong place. Usually on a circumstance where you're going on a trip, you double check your stuff, especially you've got one backpack. You look in it, make sure you got your money. You got your, I don't believe for a minute that she accidentally left that, um, that uh, driver's license. I believe she wanted to go home. And so she sent him on and then she was home. She had hours at home. What was happening in the hours at home? One is uh, that she could have then gotten the clothes that she wanted into her backpack. Would her husband know if she packed winter clothing in her backpack? He wouldn't have a clue. And again, he's a guy. So does he really pay attention to every one of his wife's clothing? Would he even know it's his wife's, wife's clothing? And she could have bought things too. You know, there are campsites nearby. She could have stopped at a store and bought something that she needed. Um, she could have done that, but she could have also just simply packed it. And he wouldn't have any clue that that was what was actually in her backpack. Um, she could have packed a blue, uh, an extra uh, backpack hidden in the, the red backpack so that when she left, she could just dump everything, have her blue backpack, 
her little sunglasses so nobody could see her face and walk away in different clothes, sunglasses, different backpack and get out of town and she would have nobody having a sighting of her whatsoever. And that's what she's found with in the mountains. And a guy, the guy who killed her buried the backpack, buried the shirt, buried the sunglasses. And the police are saying they thought they were the, the killers. The killer doesn't need to bury those things. He didn't take those things with him. I mean, I don't, he wouldn't bury them. There's no good reason for it. So to me, once he killed her, he just left all her things with her, hoping none of them would ever be found on this slight slope or whatever, away from the campground. And he hoped that just you know, wouldn't be found, at least not for a long time. And they were her things anyway. So what does it matter? Just he didn't want to he didn't want to walk away with those things, because then if somebody said, oh, I saw her with a blue backpack and those sunglasses, he would have them. and He wouldn't want to take them with him. So I think he buried all her stuff with her and walked away. Now, why didn't he take her money? Maybe he didn't know the money was in those things, because what happened may have happened in some kind of argument. Uh, some kind of, who knows what went wrong up there. Um, I don't think it was an anonymous serial killer just coming by. I don't think she went up there by herself, camping in the mountains, and then some serial killer just happened to show up at that one campground and, and attack her. She wasn't, there was no sign that she still had her clothes on. She's, I mean, her least, suppose, she had her bottom clothes on. So she had around her legs the 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 long johns and, and, the, and the pants. So she wasn't riped. So serial killer doesn't need to, you know, he's gonna, if it's, that's what he is, he's probably going to do more to her. So it sounds like to me, because there was a blanket up there too, that somebody was with her, something went wrong, somebody stabbed her because they were in an argument with her, and then they freaked out. Oh my God, what do I do? I got to cover this up. Probably never thinking about the money, the, the wedding ban. What the hell? You know, just want to get this taken care of and get the hell out of here. You know, pack up the tent, pack up the picnic stuff, whatever it was, get out of here. You know, um, and and hope nobody ever figures out it I was with her. That would be my theory about what happened there. Now, the question would be, how did she get to North Carolina? All right. I'm going to stop here before I go to that. Check your comments out again. As now we're going to see how she got from Philadelphia to North Carolina. Um, uh, she would have left a note, though, because of her kids. You'd think... Not necessarily true. There's so many people that disappear um, and don't leave notes. They do. Um, maybe because she she planned to eventually contact her kids. I don't know. Um, but I'll get. Uh, let's see. I want to go back up here a minute um, and see what y'all had to say. Uh, she could have been saving up cash for a while. She could have been. Yes. Um, is there any way she could have stabbed herself? No. It was a no, uh, good. But it's a good question. No, it's, you say it's a dumb theory. No, and it's, it's, if you're going to profile a crime or analyze a crime, you want to ask everything. Could she have stabbed herself? Yes, she could have, because she could have wanted to commit suicide and decided to go to her, a place that's beautiful and alone that nobody would find her. You know, she actually wanted to kill herself, as opposed to people who managed to take just enough medicine five minutes before their husband comes home. And, oh, they found them and take them to the hospital. That's called... What they call attempted suicide is what I call fake attempted suicide for attention. If you know you're going to be found before you die, you're not really planning to die. Because believe me, if you want to kill yourself, it's not that hard. Um, it's not. Uh, so she wanted to kill herself for real. You, she might have decided, I'm just going to disappear. I want to go up to this beautiful place by myself, commune with nature. And I'm just going to take that knife and, and nobody can save me. Yeah, except that the knife wasn't there. <laughs> that's, that's what throws it off. And she was in a shallow grave. In other words, enough of a shallow grave that she couldn't have buried herself. Um, and they buried the other items as well. But it's a perfectly good question because I asked it myself. I just said, okay, let me just make sure that there's not a possibility that nobody killed her, but she killed herself, um, you know, by like stabbing herself and then rolling around and you know, putting the you know, blanket over her and holding it to herself. But apparently she was buried enough and the other items were buried enough that, and there's no knife. So no, somebody else killed her. Um, so I think that's perfectly fine. Um, I felt like she did this. Oh, see, you're saying here, it feels like she did this all alone. She chose a place that she could walk in and still be in nature. I agree. And I think it would be reasonable, except that, again, somebody had to have killed her. So we have to take, this is where I talk about evidence. 
The evidence is she was buried in a shallow, shallow grave. Somebody had to kill her. Uh, one of the evidence pieces, which I think is fascinating, is the blanket. Again, because when you go for a day hike, you don't carry a blanket with you. You don't. Uh, you don't wear thermal underwear on a day hike unless you're like in Alaska. This was, it could be chilly in the morning, but, but you know you're going to get hot really quick. So, yeah, you could wear it and then rip it off and put it in your backpack. True. But the blanket, the blanket, you don't carry a blanket on a day hike. Um, not even if you're going to stop and sit down, you know, you don't usually do that. So the blanket to me either means they were planning on a picnic or more likely because you had the, the long johns on, they stayed overnight in that campsite. Uh, for with you know, They could have had a tent because it doesn't mean the killer didn't pick the tent up and go. You know, they could have had a tent um, and, and I say sleeping bags and a blanket and planned on a whole nice weekend and things didn't go well. And then, you know, he after she got killed, he buried her and everything with her and then ran off with the remains and of the campsite and nobody knows they were camping. Um, let's see. Uh, Lisa, knowing nothing about this case before the show. All right. My gut reaction to hearing about a woman gone missing and was found elsewhere than the place she was thought to be last seen was she had a secret lover. This is an interesting point. And, and the secret lover is possible, but it's also possible she had a secret, what I call friend. Um, and I can't prove either one of these things. So I'm going to get to that in just a second. Lisa S. has agreed to meet him at a certain place, a third destination, which no one would know about except for her and her lover in turn. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, that's okay. I want to get to the point of a pre a prearranged location. I like this, Lisa. Okay. Also, Lisa says about the, uh, the arthritic knees. I have both of mine replaced and I can walk, hike, climb. So it's not unusual case by case. True. Um, let's see. Uh, so could a third person lover have killed her? Well, yeah. So uh, somebody else did kill her. Uh, parking close would help a killer too. This is correct. I, I don't know how close they don't tell me how close the parking is. And, you know, I've been looking on the maps and everything. I can't figure out how close it is, but you know, a backpacker can easily carry a, 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 a little tent with him and sleeping bag, uh, those kind of things. Um, and hike for whatever it takes to get into the picnic side area and camp up there. Um, husband knew husbands know nothing <laughs> possible. Sorry, dog, be quiet. I'm sorry, dog. The dog is barking behind me. You hear that woof, woof, woof? That's a German Shepherd. Why are you barking, German Shepherd? Uh, so annoying. Why was there no rape? Well, probably because he didn't want to rape her. That may be the issue. Um, I, I don't hear about the shirt being stabbed, which also makes me wonder. Just the bra having stab marks in it. So either... She took off her shirt and they got in some kind of argument and he stabbed her because it wasn't, you know, there wasn't any sex going on or they could have had sex. Well, she was still dressed and everything. Oh, dog, be quiet. I'm going to might have to go take care of the dog problem out there. Um, oh, I mean, no rape because it was a woman. Okay. That doesn't mean he wouldn't have. Okay. Let's say. God. Hold on one second, folks. I'm slithering out of here. I just want to get rid of the dog sound. Hold on a second. Back in just a second, it's a cat dog fight. Okay, come here, cat. Food. Come and eat. Eat in the kitchen. Food. Come and eat in the kitchen. Okay. Why, hi there. <laughs> I lost my glasses. What do I do with them? I can't see. Hold on one more second. Hello. <laughs> Don't you just live love live shows? This is what the fun stuff. That was that was the dog attacking my cat trying to get in the front door. So 
The dog is now in that house. The cat is now in this house. <sighs> We're good. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've disappeared in the Pisca forest. I'm back. I haven't been killed. <sighs> okay. Uh, okay. So not that a woman can't rape somebody. No. Um, if they were, if it was another, if it was a female and it could be, so that's a good point you make. She could have had a female lover or a female friend and she could have gone down to the Pisgah forest, um, to go hang out with that person for a romantic thing or just as a friendship. Um, and then while they were there, um, they were going like, to say the shirt's not on. That could be the beginning of something sexual. Um, it could be, for example, that the friend wanted more romance than she did and said, oh, no. And then friend got mad or or there was an argument. They were getting, you know, she just had happened to have the shirt off and they got in an argument and Frank, you know, could be. So I won't take a female out of that possibility. Could have been a romance. It could have been a friendship. It could have been just somebody she knew who was helping her out, getting her out of town. We'll never know that unless they catch whoever did it. Um, so we don't know. Um, <laughs> I love this. It happens as it happens at bats. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is an unedited show, and this is proof. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Brief intermission to re rescue Ziggy. Lots of laughs. Yes, and here's Ziggy right here lying on the floor next to me now. <sighs> yeah, I don't know what. Hmm, there was a, I said, a big, huge fight outside. So anyway, now to the gray car. This is I know we got a point to the gray car issue. And then we're going to go back to the... the um, uh, the, the driver's license issue, not getting on the plane, and the gray car issue. And I think this all might link in um, quite well. Now, um, Judy's family didn't know why the heck she would have gone to uh, North Carolina. It wasn't like she had f folks down there, friends down there. They had no clue. All right. Um, she had been to North Carolina before, but not in that area. So maybe she had a fast. She was doing nursing once, and maybe she visited a, a, took a patient on a drive there. So nobody quite knows, but she might have had some kind of awareness of the area. Now, the sightings in Asheville. Several people in Asheville area recall having seen Judy or a woman matching her description. Again, 50-year-old white woman with blonde, blonde hair to the shoulders. That's overweight. Yeah, half the population of the area. All right. So a clerk at a local retailer said she seemed very alert to me. She was very pleasant. I didn't see anything about her that would indicate she wasn't right in any way. The woman she talked to said her husband was an attorney from Boston attending a conference in Philadelphia. And during that time, she had just decided to go to the Asheville area. Now, now, mind you, that flyer had been out. Um, and by the time they talked to these people, it was a long time away. So that it's possible she already knew the woman had been in Philadelphia with her attorney husband and that she had come to North Carolina. We don't know that the woman didn't make that crap up. Is it possible that Judy did say that to somebody? She came down there and she was just saying, yeah, he thought she might have not worried about it. She might have just like, you know, by the time nobody's going to know about this, you know, anyway. And she wasn't planning to get killed. You know, people don't say, oh, they're probably going to be murdered tomorrow. So this is going to be important. <laughs> you know, she may have decided she was just going to vanish for a while or she was going to vanish forever even. And nobody's going to give a crap that she said something about having a husband in Philly. So that may have been her. It may have been. Now, then it says this, an employee at the Biltmore Estate also recalls seeing Judy. That's the Biltmore Estate. It's a really pretty place in Asheville. It's, uh, and I don't know how he would have seen Judy because the amount of tourists that go through, th through there every day, and I've been there, it's ridiculous. So that he would remember this one woman, get out of here. Um, uh, at a campground near where her body was found, a campground where her body was found, the owner recalls, remember I just showed you the other, that RV area right nearby? Um, uh, the owner recalls she drove up in a gray sedan. I, so this is, this, is not, this is the RV campground. I believe that uh, I showed, let me show you the, the picture again. Uh, that was this one. Wait a minute, that's not that one. Sorry, take that back. Where was it? Where was the RV campground? Oh, maybe that was it. Wait a minute, hold on a second. Yeah. No, nah, no, that's not it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Where is it? Where did I put it? This one. There we go. Uh, the Stony Fork Creek RV place. Now, I don't know that this is what they're talking about, but this is nearby. 
And so you can see there's a little green area and places where you can park your vehicle. Um, a, at a campground near where her body was found. So again, we're not in the middle of like, like up there in the mountains. It's not like it's so isolated. Um, the owner recalls she drove up in a gray sedan filled with boxes and bags and asked if she could spend the night there in her car and drove away after learning she could not. Um, so where, if this was really Judy, A, where does the gray sedan come from? B, why is it gray sedan filled with boxes and bags? And I don't, you know, when they say filled, uh, he is a guy with a campground. So a lot of people stay at campgrounds, go there with their possessions. A lot of people who um, sort of homeless, um, but not, not necessarily homeless, homeless. You know what I mean? Uh, they're not indigent totally. They just, they're on social security. They can't afford whatever they, you know, these days afford a, a, an apartment by themselves. So they live in a camper. Sometimes they do live in a car and have maybe camping equipment. So they go to a campground and they have their worldly goods in there with them. But then they, you know, set up their campsite and they sleep in their tent and they eat their food and they make themselves a life on the road. Um, that's very, very popular, especially down like in Florida. Uh, where it's warm. Um, so she asked if she could, but she couldn't because I guess they were full, full up. A deli owner in the same area told the Philadelphia City paper that Judy came to, and I, by the way, I hate it when they say, said that Judy came. They don't know it's Judy. A woman that looks like Judy. They don't, you know, there's poor reporting when you say that is Judy because there's not proof of that. Uh, a deli owner in the area said that Judy came to the, her store in a gray sedan and bought $30 worth of sandwiches and a toy truck. Local investigators consider these sightings credible. All right. So in the area, a woman that looks like her, but again, can look like a lot of other women, was seen in a gray sedan. And if this is Judy, and it could well be only because Judy died right there in that area. And so she had to get there some how buses don't roll in there so she had to be in a vehicle of some sort so i don't have too much of a problem with her being in this gray sedan the problem comes down to is where the heck does the gray sedan come from so let's say she were rolling in from uh this is this will be right away remember she got murdered quite quickly so it wasn't like she lived in the area for like a month or two supposedly she was killed quite quickly um so she leaves philadelphia somehow Let's say she took a bus. Where'd the gray sedan come from? So she rolls into Asheville and gets out and buys a gray sedan. There's no no record of her buying anything. Nobody in the area says, the woman just gave me 2,000 bucks, 5,000 bucks and bought this old gray sedan. Nobody says that. So where'd the gray sedan come from? And she was driving it. So that's also interesting. Somebody let, if either was her gray sedan or somebody let her drive their gray sedan. If that's true, it's unlikely to be that she was picked up by some hitchhiking. She was hitchhiking and the guy, person who picked her up let her drive his sedan. Probably not. Um, so here is the only theory I can come up with that makes any sort of sense. Um, something was amiss in the marriage so that she made a decision to not get on the plane, that she wanted to go back to her house to prepare for something. If that sedan was something she was driving, then it well may be that she took some boxes, some of her things, and had somebody meet her at her home, and she put the boxes in that vehicle. And her husband may know more than he ever said. He may, after once she disappeared in Philadelphia, and it may be the reason he hired the private investigators was because he had a clue that something, he went home and thought things are missing that shouldn't be missing. But he didn't want to tell anybody this because then, you know, it's like, I don't want to admit this. So he just got himself a private investigator and said, look, something suspicious here. I think she may have gone off with somebody. Go figure it out. That's what I think. So now what happens is she, she comes back home. She meets the person. She puts all her stuff in the vehicle that she wants to take with her. And then she says to them, meet me in Philadelphia. Remember I said, it's only like five hours to Philadelphia from Boston. So meet me in Philadelphia. I'm taking the plane. I'll meet you tomorrow morning someplace. And some, and the morning comes, she gets ready. She goes out and she meets that person, wherever that gray sedan is going to be, jumps in that vehicle and off they go down to North Carolina. Now she's down there with somebody. 
she's bought if it's true she bought thirty dollars worth of sandwiches she's either a very hungry woman <laughs> or somebody is going to share those with her and okay you're in a campsite area you know you're not talking about really fine sandwiches so the sandwiches have to be you know not that great you know so maybe if it was if she was buying for herself uh somebody and a kid because of that toy truck issue um maybe she bought four sandwiches they didn't say how many sandwiches she bought but she could have bought four two for the dude one for herself or two for the other woman and one for the kid i don't know uh she bought this stuff all right uh if it was her and if it was her the person let her drive the sedan Maybe didn't have a problem with it at that point. Now she drives the sedan, goes and gets some stuff. They go back wherever they're staying at. I don't know where they're staying at. Maybe they're camping, maybe whatever. Uh, maybe. And so then they decide they're going to go to this location. And off they go to that location and they camp and something goes amiss. She's killed there. The person with, buries her, gathers up all the stuff, puts the crap in the gray sedan, wherever that gray sedan is parked, and gets the hell out of Dodge. And nobody knows who owns the gray sedan. And there you, there you're left with the final mystery. Um, I personally think that the truth of this case lies back in Boston in that home with that husband, with whatever may be missing from that home with whomever might have been in the area, because if she was able to put things in a vehicle and if that vehicle picked her up in Philadelphia and took her South, that person probably did live in the Boston area or have some reason to be in the Boston area. So, and she had to know them. It wasn't like complete random, you know, just ran into somebody. Um, so I think there is more to the story that the husband probably did not want to admit. That's my personal belief on that. Um, he, I, I do believe he thought, you know, he freaked out when she disappeared because all his behaviors are correct for that. But then once he started thinking about it and thought something's not right here, then he might well have, once he got home, thought, why is this missing? <laughs> why is that missing? Maybe she ran away. You know, maybe there's something else going on here. And then he hires the private investigators. Because um, people do hire private investigators to find out what happened to their missing loved ones. That does happen quite often. But in this case, I wonder if the reason was because he knew that she he believed she was alive. He believed she was somewhere with somebody and uh, could figure out where she went to and tell her to come home and whatever, um, find out who was with her, uh, but never had the opportunity because she was found then. No, no, the, the trail went cold because she was dead and nobody had a clue for five months what happened to her until they found her body. So very, very peculiar case. But those are the things that I thought were particularly uh fascinating about the case um <laughs> 30 dollars worth of sandwiches and a toy truck that's a whole lot of sandwiches uh again this was by the time people they found her body nobody reported this crap until after they found her body so you're talking about somebody's trying to remember five months ago did they really remember how many sandwiches she bought you know this is where witness reports get stupid um, maybe it was only $20 worth of sandwiches. Maybe they exaggerated that. Maybe the toy truck wasn't even something she bought. It's not like they had, oh, look, she's, here's the receipt. No, the woman had the receipt. They, you know, did she buy a toy truck or was it somebody else who bought a toy truck for their kid? So we don't even know that any of that's true. Um, and so you have to, have to take that with a grain of salt. Um, so the things we know is that she did get to North Carolina. She did die at that campsite, in my opinion. Uh, she wasn't carried to the entire campsite. She was buried nearby the campsite. So she got there somehow. And the fact that she had changed her clothes and um, been seen in town, theoretically been seen in town, you know, it's just unlikely she went, just got kidnapped off the streets of Philadelphia by some complete stranger. Oh, and here's another good point. People with kidnapped people, <laughs> husbands with women, that, that wives they want to get rid of, don't drive eight hours to North Carolina. They live, this is Philadelphia. Don't you know there's mountains near Philadelphia? I mean, I live in uh, Maryland. There's a lot of nice little rolling hills and mountains here. You can dump a body all those places. Um, you know, there's lots of other places to dump bodies closer to Philadelphia than drive all the way eight hours to North Carolina. You don't need to go that far. You can go two hours and you're good. Maybe go one hour and you're good. So if you want to get some, you know, not have an extended period of time where you've got, and a kidnap victim with you or a body with you 
and and you can be tracked. All your um, your uh, movements can be tracked through tolls or, or stores or gas stations. You just want to go kind of close, dump them there, and come back and show up again. So if the husband, let's say she got to Philadelphia and he got all pissed at her and said, "Hey, let's take a little let's take a little ride in the you know a romantic ride in the dark," he could have taken her an hour away, killed her, thrown her there, and gotten back and appeared in the morning. And said she went on her travels. So it wouldn't have to go eight hours away. So the only reason she's going to go eight hours away is because somebody, she had to have a plan to go to that distance uh, to get away for whatever reasons. And whatever those reasons are, we don't actually know them. Um, uh, okay, she disappeared in April, said Carolina. Her bones were found in September. When do you think she died? The theory is she died. Her, they actually thought she was there were only bones left. So she had been there a long time. Um, the, and since she wasn't much seen around, um, the theory is that she died quite quickly after she arrived in North Carolina. So she probably died in April as well, um, quite, quite soon after. Uh, but, you know, there's, not, there's no way to be, you know, pinpoint that exactly. Delaware River. <laughs> I'm not sure what that is, but okay. Um, let's see what else you have to say here. I honestly don't buy... 100% buy any of the, the sightings, correct? Except that the fact there's so many, at least one is right. <laughs> and there is the dilemma, which one is right? Which one makes most sense? I personally don't find any of the Philadelphia ones make a damn bit of sense. I personally think she changed up the backpack because why not? I mean, if you're trying to sneak away, you don't want to be recognized. And the, and the sunglasses make me think that, um, I don't think she wanted to be recognized in Philadelphia. I think she wanted to disappear and not have people identify like her getting into the vehicle or at a certain location. She, you know, you don't want to be tracked. I think she, she, she changed up quite quickly and disappeared out of there so that nobody would know. Uh, that's my personal opinion on that. Um, but so the sightings up there are questionable. Sightings in North Carolina, once you're free from where you're at and you're kind of off on your own, you know, you can get kind of like, you know, careless. Um, I don't know about whether she was drinking anything either. Um, sometimes that loosens people's tongues. She could have had a couple beers or she could have had, you know, who knows, sat out having a margarita. And then it's like, oh, yeah, that Philadelphia because my husband was up there. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know. But two people right around that location saw the gray sedan right in the area where she ended up dead. That one is the most likely correct sighting, in my, my opinion, those, those two gray sedan sightings. Um, so let's see what else we have here. Um, Lisa N says, very interesting theory. Thanks, Pat. Surprising that no friends or family in Boston or the PI came up with any ideas of friends who might have gone with her. I get why you say husband suspects, suspects more. Um, there is very little written about this case. So we can't say that the PI, uh, that the police, that the friends, that the kids didn't come up with more. We're not hearing a lot about Judy. All right. Um, remember the, the thing I always say that it's interesting how one of the number one um, uh, professions of people with exhibit Munchausen syndrome is nursing. <laughs> and Munchausen syndrome being getting attention for yourself. She was a home care nurse, not saying anything about home care nurses, but I'm just saying it's interesting. I don't know her history. You know, she's on a, she's on her third marriage. Uh, do, does she love, do her kids know more than we think? Do they actually say, you know, mom's got problems. Mom likes attention. Maybe the husband's thinking, God, did she, does she, she, she running off to, so I go running after her. I don't know because nothing has been said about her actual psych, psychological history at all. Um, so we don't know. Uh, and because we don't know, it's hard to, it's hard to analyze that. So I have to stick with the only facts that we do know. Uh, and certain facts seem to be absolute, like cause she's dead, uh, you know, and she died at a, there in the mountains. There's no question. Um, and there are things around her that suggest because of the evidence that she changed clothes and changed her backpack to. And the only reason you would do that is because you were trying to disappear at least for a period of time that you were trying to disappear unnoticed for a period of time. Otherwise you wouldn't care. Uh, Dr. Dr. Grande has a theory that uh, she was running around town being like a little bit, you know, Hey, I'm crazy. And then everybody know I'm crazy. So I can eventually come back possible. Maybe, but 
you know, I, I personally don't believe that. I think that would be, I, if you're going to do that, you have to do it in a place where you can be sure that they would know it was you and not mistake you for the homeless woman. Um, it'd be in another co complete city. You don't go over to New Jersey and then go, hey, let me let me go crazy here in New Jersey and Macy's. Uh, that makes no sense. You do it someplace where you go, you know, where you make it obvious that it's you. Even from, you know, you can even leave your hotel. Husband's already at the thing. You could start at your hotel with your red backpack going, am I in New Jersey? <sighs> You know, you could do strange things there. And then they, they have a whole staff going, you know, your wife left the place. She's act, acting crackers, you know, but the fact is she's not any place where she's identified as Judy and she's not near enough to any location that could prove she's Judy. So I find it weird that you would go halfway across town on a park bench and talk to a homeless person and say, I'll be crackers here so that people will think that I'm crazy. And that'll get back to my husband. That I, mean, I can't buy it. That just doesn't even work. Um, let's see. Hmm. Doreen says, maybe hubby dearest was controlling and awful and she trusted the wrong person to help her get away. Maybe. Very maybe. Um, yes, very maybe. Uh, the fact that she bought the flowers, I said, there's two possibilities of the flowers. One, she was trying to butter him up before she vanished. Uh, two, she was afraid of him. And she, she was some control and she, he knew, she knew he was that angry that she had not gotten on the plane. So she brought him flowers. But the only reason I think it could, and it could be a combination. He was very controlling. So she thought what I'll do is I'll not get on the plane and then I will pack up everything. I'll get there He'll and I'll give him my apologies and he'll think I'm, you know, oh honey, I'm sorry I did that. And then I will be free to vanish and get in that car and go away. And it won't be tracked back to the house. Um, it's hard to know what the whole sequence of thinking would have been, but he could have been very controlling. Again, we don't know. Uh, people say, you know, you know, he's a nice guy. They seem to have a good marriage. Who says that? <laughs> How often were the children around to note their behaviors with each other? Uh, what went on behind those closed doors? Uh, you know, I don't know. And I, I think that any, anybody thinks they know doesn't know. Um, and Lisa says, I lean toward that ther theory, Doreen. Uh, I, you know, it seemed like she had a reason to want to go away. But then again, maybe she was one of those people that loved Lots of crazy attention. Maybe she was getting bored with the marriage already. Hard to know where you want to put blame. And we can't because we don't know a thing about these two people. Um, again, if I were on the insider's investigation, I was one of those detectives. I might learn a lot more. Uh, husband refused to take a polygraph. Um, he said he had good reasons. He didn't trust them. Um, and he might be right. Maybe the reason the police were so suspicious of him for so long is because of his demeanor. So maybe it's something came off, was off about the guy that bugged them. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the PIs found. I just don't know. So all I can go on is what evidence I have tells me that she wasn't kidnapped. Absolutely wasn't kidnapped. Um, that somebody helped her leave the area. Because otherwise, I don't know where that gray sedan would have come from. Uh, I don't know how she would have gotten to North Carolina and have no record of her getting there. I don't know how she would have gotten to the mountains. Um, unless somebody was with her with a vehicle. So for those reasons, I honestly believe she planned this. She decided to leave. She went with somebody and something went wrong. Uh, let's see what else you have to say here. Uh, what was she of sound mind? Well, this is, this is what was Dr. Dr. Grande points out the four possibilities of her having these issues, not being a sound mind. Um, but there's no, Nobody said she wasn't a sound mind prior to that moment. And secondly, as she planned this, she had some mental faculties to work with. She wasn't totally out to lunch. Um, could she have had issues? Yeah, she could have been highly narcissistic. She could have, had, uh, but doc, uh, Dr. Grandi thinks possibly bipolar. Uh, he actually has a couple of things. Let me, let me point out what he says here. A thing called dissociative amnesia an inability to recall important autobiographical information. This is one of it. And he didn't, he think, he didn't think this was highly likely. Um, uh, dissociative fit fugue, where you have purposeful travel but, or bewildering wandering. In other words, you suddenly go into some kind of dis, 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 uh, dissociative state, kind of like DID thing, the dissociative identity disorder. Yeah, like multiple personality things, where part of your brain goes out to lunch, the other part takes you someplace. 
he didn't go for that too much either. He did say this, the bipolar disorder and manic phase. And I think he might be a little closer if you're going to go with psychological things. He said he didn't, she didn't take the 500 in the hotel room. So she, in other words, she went into a manic phase. She wasn't thinking totally clearly. Well, again, that 500 was maybe his and maybe she didn't want him to know she was like taking the money and running, not taking her passport. He was incorrect. He meant the, he meant the driver's uh, driver's license that maybe she did forget her driver's license because she wasn't thinking properly. Suddenness of her decision. Was it sudden? Not using her credit cards while well, she was dead pretty soon. Maybe she did. And she did, if she didn't want to be seen leaving town. She might not have used those credit cards. Acting in a bizarre manner in Philadelphia. Dr. Grande bought a lot of those sightings in Philadelphia. And I disagree with him on that. Uh, I think I think those are not. Uh, I don't think he did enough research into that. They, th those were mostly disproven. And I think he didn't see that part. Um, and so he thought she might have been. She was acting bizarrely in Philadelphia. And involving in goal-oriented behavior like hiking in a manic state. That makes sense because sometimes when you're manic, you want to do very energetic things past your own normal ability. Like, I'm going to get out of town. I'm going to take a hike. Kind of go. I can kind of see where he comes with that. Um, and then he does point out that, uh, what does he point out? Wait a minute. Oh, he points out that she might have forgotten her driver's license as an excuse to go back and get some stuff she had forgotten or didn't want Jeffrey to see. So he did point out that possibility. Then he goes to, he had like four different possibilities. And his fourth one, and this is the one he believes most. Judy knew exactly what she was doing and didn't want to be with Jeffrey anymore. Perhaps she chose dis behaviors that would mimic dissociative fugue to confuse people and make people think she just got lost her mind and ran off. I disagree with that. I don't think anything in Philadelphia had to do with her. I don't think she faked anything. I think she snuck away. But he thought she faked things in order to be able to run away. She wanted to have fun, but she wanted to be able to come back someday. Should she have an excuse for her little disappearing act? I don't agree with that. Uh, I see why he's saying that. If if it was proven that she was the woman in Philadelphia, or the many women in Philadelphia who were acting oddly, yeah. But I don't see that to be true. Um, and I don't believe, they had already put out the thing about the red backpack. So first of all, most people didn't mention the red backpack. One person did. The other ones just said a woman her age. Um, and again, if she wanted to fake this, she would have faked it where people would be sure it was her, not some vague thing in New Jersey. It just makes no sense at all. So I don't believe that. I believe she snuck away. Um, let's see. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, let's see what you have to say here. Um, <laughs> actually, Gone Girl would do, totally do the flower thing. <laughs> Anybody who's read Gone Girl, which, by the way, I think is a terrible book and a terrible movie. But maybe I'll do a show on that one day. I thought it was ridiculous. But um, very popular movie. Um, but yeah, she was a very, Gone Girl, she was a ma massive psychopath and planned all kinds of sneaky things. So um, let's see. Yeah, if somebody snatched her in Philly, the Delaware River isn't that far. Yeah, I mean, you don't go to North Carolina. It's just too much work. Um, uh, disappearing and starting again is a fantasy a lot of people have, though few ever attempt it. That is true. Uh, especially with very little stuff with you, but who knows? I mean, sometimes people just don't have a good way out of where they're at. Now, she had been divorced two times, so, you know, you think she could just put the third time on the plate. Um, I, you know, she, people would say things like, well, she could have gotten alimony then because, you know, he had he was a pretty well-off fellow, um, and she could have gotten good alimony out of it, but the answer to that is no. Um, they don't give you alimony anymore these days. Even if you haven't been working for 20 years and, 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 and the, let's say for example, a woman has been home with children for 20 years, husband has gotten up to a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars in a job. In the old days, they would have said, well, she's, she, she hasn't been working. So therefore she deserves alimony. These days they say, if she can work tough luck. And so this one, uh, Judy was a nurse. She could get work. So she wouldn't get alimony and, and he could probably afford a better lawyer than her. So, um, but she, she would just get divorced and just walk away, probably leave or whatever. I mean, she, she might get something like part of the house or something. She might get more than if she ran away, but who knows? Maybe he was very controlling. Maybe she didn't want to deal with him. Maybe she just wanted to escape. And maybe not even as Dr. Grande points out in the sense that maybe it wasn't a permanent escape. Maybe she just wanted to disappear and tough luck. Ha ha, honey. Um, eventually she would have called him a week later, says I'm in North Carolina. I just, you drove me crazy and I ran away. She could have done that, but she was probably dead by then. 
Um, so it's hard to say. We, we don't know what she would have done if she hadn't been killed. Um, I saw somewhere she didn't really want to get married and wasn't too keen on signing a prenup. Oh, yeah, Carolyn. I forgot about that. I did forget about that. Um, yeah, I read that someplace, too. Uh, I think um, I didn't know if it was true. And that's that's always the problem with, you know, when you're trying to do, you know, Internet research, which is why I'm really careful about gossip and crap, because I know she's dead in North Carolina. That's a police issue. But, you know, and I don't know that she didn't want to sign a prenup that somebody said that. And they've been they've been hanging out together for a long time. Uh, it was quite a few years before they got married. And I don't know that she didn't really want to get married or maybe she didn't want to get married. If she had to sign a prenup that pissed her off. Um it's hard to say, you know, why they ended up getting married. Did she need to? Because she was already, you know, kids were grown. She didn't have to get married. A lot of people don't. She was already living with a guy, I think. So it wasn't like she was, I have to get married to have sex. You know, so I don't know. But maybe she, maybe he was, maybe he was very controlling. And eventually she caved in and now she's not happy. Don't know. <laughs> she, Martin says she was a sandwich, a sandwich short of a picnic. <laughs> Well, after the picnic, clearly she had a lot of sandwiches missing, which are very, very sad. Um, very, very sad. Um, okay, here's an interesting point. Oh, let me look here. Um, she's doing a lot of manipulative things, like maybe starting the fight about breakfast. Okay, we don't know who started the fight about breakfast, though. We don't know whether he started it or she started it. Because he's saying that he went and ate breakfast without her because she was sleeping. He came back. She was taking a shower. He just mentioned she should go get some food. And she said, hi, you want me to go down there naked? Now, that's his story. And if she was being really awful, you would think he would have told that story. But he didn't. He told an actually nice story about her and a nice story about him. So my belief is it didn't quite go that way. I'm thinking more likely he told her to get the hell out of the shower and, you know, got to go. I want to go have my breakfast now. I got, I'm out of time. And she says, you want me to go down there naked or what? And he goes, oh, fine, just take a shower. I'm going to go eat. You eat later. That's what I think happened. That's, that's more likely, but he didn't want to come off sounding to the police. Like he was a jerk, especially when his wife was missing. So he says, oh, you know, I went early and then I, she was showering. She made a funny joke and I told her, have a great breakfast. You know, and I, I don't know that I blame him. <laughs> You know, you don't want when your wife is missing to come off like a guy who wants her to go missing. You know, so maybe he lied because he was just, met, let me improve that story. I don't want him to think we fought. Because also if I make, here's the thing too, he could be innocent of this. He might think if I tell them the truth that we had a fight, they're going to think she ran away and then they're not going to look for her. And I'm trying to find her and bring her home. And if I just say, oh yeah, we had a big fight. They're going to say, Pff. so he says, we didn't have a fight. We, she went away happy and she was supposed to be back for a wonderful evening. So he might have changed that whatever happened in order to make sure the police pursued looking for her. So I can't even say I blame him for that. It could be a really great guy who just wanted to find his wife. I don't know. We don't know. Uh, so. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Annika's got to go. Or maybe she was really being flirty and he was proud. Uh, she was quite heavy, overweight. You know, I'm overweight at the moment. I'm going to tell you, when I stand in front of a mirror, I'm not like joking about people being finding me sexy when I hit the breakfast table. Maybe maybe before coronavirus, I would have said that. <laughs> she was quite overweight, obese. I, it, it, it's, I can see she's joking. I could see where she's joking about, uh, when they want me to go down there naked, not because it's going to excite people, but because it would be embarrassing. And but that it's flirty in the site uh, that he's proud of. Uh, I, I'm not going to go with that one. But Annika says, I'm obviously just going to try every theory until Pat likes one. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> um, what's this? Oh, here in the UK, <laughs> here in the UK, we would say she pulled the Lord Luke and oh my goodness, I won't get into the Lord Luke and story. Um, I will not. Oh, and, and, and uh, Joe says, exactly. <laughs> uh, I think I did talk about Lord Lucan already um, in one of the hangouts. Um, but that's a whole, that's a whole nother matter. Uh, but, you know, the, their women have gone missing before. Men have gone missing before. The old, you know, he went out for a pack of cigarettes and never came back, you know. And then ended up with another wife and three other children. And it's true. It happens. Uh, people do walk out on their lives. Um 
because sometimes they just think their lives aren't what they want. And if they can just get away and they can be somebody else, suddenly they can just be somebody else. And, you know, uh, and maybe it would have worked out for her if she hadn't gotten murdered. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Joe says, I hear you, Pat. If the body's a temple, mine's up for urban renewal. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> yes, yeah, sometimes that does happen in life. I mean, you know, yeah, it's just, uh, that's just realism. And, and I want to point out something else that's very important with uh, profiling and investigation is to be realistic um, about people about our, ourselves, because a lot of times people in trying to be overly kind or overly, uh, I don't know, romanticizing things or not wanting to think the worst can just completely ignore stuff that's that's a fact. Um, I've, I've pointed out many times that um, I, I, show, I show a picture in one of my, uh, one of my seminars on uh, serial homicide. And I, say, and I say, I show a picture of a incredibly obese woman, like, you know, one of those six, six, 700 pound woman I went, and I put underneath, not the victim of a serial killer. And um, good reason to eat Ben and Jerry's. You'll never be a victim of a serial killer. And I have had cases where when that person asked me, do I think a serial killer took this girl? I look at her picture and I go, no, it's probably a boyfriend or a friend of the family or somebody she knows. And they're like, well, why? I said, because she's fat. Oh, my God. And everybody gets mad at me. Oh, you're calling the girl fat. And you're saying that she couldn't be a victim of a serial killer because she's fat. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> because if you actually look through all the history of serial killers, very few women are fat. And I say it for a number of reasons. One is because a lot of serial killers at least want, if they're going to pick a girl like walking down the street, they want a trophy girl. Uh, somebody that society is going to be really upset about, like, you know, a little, little cheerleader girl. Um, secondly, uh, somebody they can overpower. You don't want to go for an Amazonian woman. You know, you've got a strong woman. She lifts weights and she works out at the gym. That's not the woman you pick. You know, she's this woman's 200 pounds of solid muscle. Not her, you know, uh, because so what you go for is five foot two, 100 pounds, really easy to subdue. Thirdly, and this is a reality, you want to be able to get her pants off. You know, you got a little slim girl. You got a girl that really fat. You know, she's got the pounds on her and she's got those jeans on her. You could, By the time you get her jeans halfway down, somebody else will be coming by and they'll be arrested. <laughs> you can't get her pants off. It's a fact. And then also you can't get them into the trunk of your car. Now I have a Dots Miata, uh, I'm sorry, a, Mi a Mazda Miata. All right. I can barely get a suitcase in there. If I were a serial killer driving that vehicle, I'm going to pick a very small girl. But if I get a big girl, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to drive with a trunk open and put a little tag around her foot as we get down the street. <laughs> you know? And she's too heavy. You can't drag her body. And this is one of the things they said about Judy because she was overweight. They're like, who could carry her up that slope? You know, who could do that? And certainly her obese husband couldn't do that. And so that was the big question. Now, I still don't understand the crime scene there. So I really personally think they went camp and I don't know that she went up the slope or down the slope or what, how far or whatever. But that would be important to know because if she was killed at the campsite, uh, the picnic ground area, then the question is how far was it to where her body was found? Was it up, was it down? Um, uh, what, what was it? And then who would be that person who had the strength to, to move her um, if she was already dead? Uh, that would be an important thing. Uh, and how would they move her? So I don't know those details because those aren't out in the public. Uh, I, if I knew them, I could, I could analyze this case a lot better. Um, uh, well, could you check Carolina's questions about why go to Philly at all? I, uh, I'm not sure Carolina's question on that, but are you okay? But I'm going to guess this is what it is. Um, why not just leave from Phil, why not just leave from Boston? In other words, why get on the plane to Philly? And I thought about that as well. Uh, let's say somebody picks you up there. You put your crap in the car. Couldn't you just jump in that car and leave from there and never go to Philly? Yes, you could. But I, I, the only reason I think that would be problematic is that it might be that then the focus would be back on somebody came to the house. And that's what she didn't want. 
noted that somebody came to the house and picked her up because then then the whole investigation would go to the Philly would go to the Boston area by getting on the plane the whole investigation was in Philly and nothing was in Boston um that's just a guess I, I you know again I'm, I'm lacking information I wish I had all the interviews of the husband I want to know if things went missing out of that house you know because did she just leave with a backpack and somehow somebody picked her up somewhere with a gray sedan and those boxes it's possible the boxes and the bags had nothing to do with her that's possible um it could have you know her maybe all she took was a damn backpack but maybe she didn't i don't know and because we, we don't have that information so that's why i always point out as i do every time i do the show i do not solve crimes on this show this is a d educational channel to help you understand the thinking process of analyzing crimes not that you necessarily are going to be perfect at analyzing a crime based on half crap evidence that we've got here. Um, uh, that men who type fat shame. Okay, wait a minute. Where's the fat shame thing? <laughs> wait a minute, Gretchen. I didn't mean the. Where's your Where's your other comment on the fat shaming? Um, uh, I'm going to go back up here. I can't even find that other comment that you made, Gret Gretchen. So. I'm not quite sure, but fat shaming is, I'm accused of that a lot. Um, I'm accused of fat shaming. I'm accused of shaming prostitutes. I'm accused of shaming women who, uh, you know, have um, beha behavioral issues that get them into trouble. I've been accused of shaming everybody. Uh, <laughs> but my point isn't to shame people. It's to point out, uh, make observations that have to do with analyzing crime because it's simply true. It's simple. It, these are these are facts. Um, if you're into prostitution and you go well, off with some strange guy, your chances of dying are a lot harder than if you're going to church with your family. I mean, that's the way it works. Um, and therefore, if you're you know if you're looking at who might kill somebody, you want to look at their behaviors. Um, and if you want to uh, people keep people from getting killed, you want to mention those behaviors are certain behaviors are unsafe. So it's just these are reality facts. This isn't anything about um, you know, shaming anybody, but I've been accused of that repeatedly. Um, I have a very bad reputation for that. Yes. <laughs> um, terrible. Um, uh, let's see. As me, her hus uh, husband would start looking for her right away. He, he did. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Um, trying to figure out where that was. Um, oh, <laughs> that's what Gretchen said. Originally I typed, so even serial killers fat shame. Yes. I mean, just to be honest, I mean, this is where this is where society drives me crazy. You know, this whole thing these days about how fat is beautiful and there's be huge women and aren't I gorgeous? No, you're not actually. You might have a pretty face that's very round. Um, you might be a wonderful personality, but let's face it. As I say, I've gained forty pounds during coronavirus. I don't like. I'm looking in the long mirror. I prefer. <laughs> I prefer not to go below here. Okay, I know what I looked like before. I know what I look like now. Mm -hmm. I, mm, nope. If I were if I were with somebody, I'd be undressing in the dark and making sure there were no lights on. I mean, it's just reality. I mean, so you know, we have a thing. You know, there, it's a thing called a beautiful figure, a uh, beautiful body, and it usually it usually tends to be younger, less wrinkled, less fat, include <laughs> fat, fatted up. You know, I mean, there's a reason that there are beautiful models and there are beautiful actresses and so on and so forth, and their bodies usually represent something. It doesn't mean you can't love a person who is 10 pounds heavier or 20 pounds heavier. And it doesn't mean that you can't have a, an attractive enough body when you're 30, 40 pounds heavier. And, but you know, when you're getting up to three or 400 pounds, I'm going to say that is not the general, generally people do not find that attractive. And that's a fact. So when you get to serial killers, they want something that makes them proud that they got this girl, that, that society is going to be upset about it. So if they have the choice, of the 110 pound cheerleader girl and the 250 pound girl who over there, they got to pick the cheerleader girl. And I say, it, and the other reasons is simply practical. It's harder to get the pants off, put the kid, woman in her trunk and drag her. Those are simple, <laughs> simple facts, you know, and you know, if everybody's going to be all over, overly sensitive about crime scene analysis, well, that's just too bad. You know, in your personal lives, you can have whatever beautiful thoughts you want about every single person in the world. Um, but in reality, reality is reality. So that's exactly right. Eat lots of cake. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> you're safer if you're fat. That's true. That's just the way it goes. Um, 
Thank you very much, Lisa. I don't see it as fat shaming. It's the facts. It is. It is the facts. But people, uh, exactly. Victimology. You know, victimology is important. Um, you know, we can't we can't look away from victimology if we're going to do proper profiling and detective work. Uh, we can't satisfy the the personal emotional needs of the entire population who you know is so sensitive these days that they're going to get upset about everything. You know, it's like yeah, it's just it's the way it is. You know, so. Uh, yeah, I do the same. I talk at the same thing about date rape. One of the problems with date rape is that generally it involves drinking. Generally it involves with a woman going to the guy's location or him going coming to her location. They're both drunk, um, and then she has a lack of ability to know what she to make to know what choices she's making, and b that she has lack of physical ability. And he has the same problem. So the the next morning when she's naked and he's, you know, she says, Oh my God, I slept with this dude. And, you know, sometimes she thinks I didn't say yes. You know, he, he took advantage of me and maybe they even remember some moment when they were fumbling around and suddenly she was, he was on top of her and she doesn't remember saying yes. Did, how do you prove these kind of things? This is, this is a, this is an interesting problem. So when that's why it's very hard to prove rape that occurs during a date. I don't like the term date rape. I like the rape occurs during a date because the problem is not, is that it's the time factor and the location factor and the activity factor that has the problem with trying to prove the rape. Okay. Uh, it's not like you went on a date and you were both sitting in a restaurant and you walked out and the guy attacked you in the alley. <laughs> it's not that kind of thing. It's literally usually because you're both someplace doing something and then somebody ends up having sex occurs and proving it was not consensual becomes the problem. And usually there's no physical signs of physical violence. Very hard to prove. And I tell women, look, you might have been raped, but the problem is it's hard. You can, you know, going into the police and trying to prove that is another whole matter. So if you don't want to end up in a situation where you are going to be uh, possibly not voluntarily having sex with somebody, you want to avoid being with them in a situation where you do not have control. And that's just a fact. Can't, can't change that for you. Um, yeah, but it, people don't like to hear that. It makes them upset. So uh, let's see. Uh, Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Pat cuts through the BS and says it like it is. Well, you know, as I say, I, I believe in I, I believe in facts and reality uh, and not, you know, just doing things to please people. Joe says, totally agree, Pat. By the way, I identify <laughs> as a 27-year-old Adonis, irresistible to women, and anyone who disputes this will be sued. <laughs> Any questions and I'll be in my safe space. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, uh, I'm totally with you. I'm only, I'm only 30 myself. Yeah. And, and do I use a filter? Yeah. You know, the funny, the funny thing is recently, you know, um, my, my, uh, my, uh, thumbnails are really good because I use face app on them. I'm like Hollywood number one. Oh, I look better. Cause I really don't want to see my face perfectly the way it is on my thumbnails. And then when you get here, you go, Oh, she looks a lot older than her thumbnails. But then I had the problem because I had a camera that was, when I was doing the green screen behind me, everything was going, but I looked pretty good because I could blur out, kind of do a blur on the face. And then I got this great camera and all the blurring stopped. But then I, they, then the face was like so perfect. I'm like, holy God, <laughs> I look 200 years old. So I threw that camera out and then I got this camera, which is kind of a in between. It doesn't make me look as good as the original camera, but it does stop the blurring. So, I mean, the buzzing on and all the, green screen. So now I look older than my old camera, but not as bad as the, the camera with the really great, you know, clarity. <laughs> but I prefer to at least, you know, not be totally appalled when I see myself. So yeah, <laughs> I'm okay with slight fakiness. Yeah. Mm -mm. Uh, it was, I once met a girl who claimed to be an Instagram model. In that, that case, I'm the heavyweight champion of Facebook. <laughs> Oh, there's a lot of lies that go on. There are a lot of lies. Oh, I love, I do love George Carlin. Yes, he stated facts and made people laugh. He was a genius. I absolutely love, love that guy. Uh, he was, he was fantastic. And, uh, you know, I kind of wish we need more George Carlins out here. But, you know, again, when you're coming back to analyzing crime, you know, you got to put 
the emotions, you got to put your sensitivities aside and, and go with reality uh, because that's how you solve crimes. You know, you, you, you can't solve them by pretending that doesn't work very well. And in, in families, one of the sad things true is families, um, they have trouble a lot of times telling the truth because it makes them look bad. It makes the loved one look bad who went missing. So they'll say things like, Oh, my daughter would never be a prostitute. And you know, you can go, you know, you're on, you know, like, really? <laughs> because I'm finding her page over here and uh, she's got like 50 dates in the last month. <laughs> you know, yes. Or my daughter would never go on Tinder and sleep with a guy she's never met. Yes, she would. You know, and if you, you know, but you don't want to tell anybody that. So a lot of times you get a very slanted opinion from husbands, wives, parents, kids. They don't want to say things, bad things about their mother. By the way, if my children are watching. Do not tell everybody about me, okay? Uh, <laughs> so if I end up dead someplace, do I want my kids to tell the truth about me? <laughs> or do I want them to lie? You know, <laughs> My mother was perfect, absolutely perfect woman. She would never do this and she would never do that. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Carolyn says, I remember Dick Clark and how people said he looked so young. It was because he never took a close-up photo. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Huh? Well, you know, the same thing is very true about Jane Fonda. Uh, I point that out with her because she looks better in her 80s than I do in my 60s. Actually, she looks better in her 80s than I looked in my 50s. So that's really depressing. But, I'm and, and I, you know, admittedly, um, she did a lot of, you know, uh, she was an exercise guru, so, and I'm not, um, clearly. So she did a lot to keep her body in good shape, give her all the credit in the world for that. Um, but she's had a tremendous amount of plastic surgery, and I don't fault her for it. And, you know, she wants to have her face look younger, that she does plastic surgery. But I also know that in her, in her recent uh, television series, um, she looks really good in video, and I'm like, there's no way on God's earth you she actually looks like that. Even with plastic surgery and makeup, I don't buy it. So I'm pretty sure that they use a filter on her face in the videos. So you, you see a whole show of her. And when she's on camera, her face is flat, perfect, without wrinkles. And that's not true in real life. So you get this. So for, it's sad for people who are you know older that they go, oh, my God, why don't I look like that? Well, it's because... It, that's not what she looks like either. But, you know, she's on TV, she's doing a show, she doesn't want to look like an old crow, which is probably what she looks like in person, you know, and, you know, and some people, yeah, they avoid cameras that will catch the real them because they don't want that out there. And I, I've had that same, I've had that problem. Oh my God, you know, because if I'm in a group of people doing like a seminar, somebody goes, I want to take a selfie, you know, and at my age, a selfie is something you never want. You want the person to be on the other side of the room when they take the picture. So, you know, a selfie, no, that's for 30 year olds and under, you know, so all of a sudden that picture shows up on Facebook and it's, I'm like, holy crap. Oh, you know, there's nothing I can do about it, but you know, my daughter is very nice. She never puts up Facebook pictures of me unless I, she has my approval, you know, because <laughs> I don't like them, you know? So I like being fake, but anyway, I'm not that fake. I never did plastic surgery. So, <laughs> but I believe Jamie Lee Curtis refuses to have any plastic surgery. I think she did say that. Yeah. But you know, um, so, you know, but even, you know, I've done television work and when, when you've done, they, some people done makeup on me and I've sat at a distance. I look way younger than I really am. And that was one of the difficult things about, you know, going from television to YouTube because I can't do makeup very well and I can't, I don't control things too well on lighting and everything. So I'm like, ah, oh, screw it. You know, <laughs> I don't have the energy to fight it, but, um, but I, uh, so anyway, uh, you'll be overly nice. Not so much in person, but, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, I'd say for, for, for the purposes of analysis, you gotta be real. You do, you gotta be real. Um, and you can't, you can't, and this is also true when we see, I see people analyzing crimes and they're very cautious about pissing anybody off in the internet world. So they say, well, you know, it's likely to be this, but it also could be that I could be definitely wrong. Da, 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 da. And they just hem and haw and go around the bush because they don't want people to be mad at them. And, and people do, they get really mad at you and they get nasty and, and they call you names. And, um, 
But, you know, but what it does is it distorts analysis because you can say when you can't, you don't know something, that's fine. Or it, it has the possibility of being one of two things. I don't have a problem with that. But we also don't want to get so wishy-washy that, that we don't actually look at the evidence because we're afraid to be real, uh, afraid to truly analyze. And that's just not good work. Um, let's see what... <laughs> <laughs> really? I was walking around the large shopping mall today and everybody looked like they had plastic surgery. <laughs> well, that's that's creepy. Oh, maybe you need to move to a new location. That's kind of scary. Um, Joe says this term sex worker is designed to somewhat legitimize prostitution. That's a bad thing. Destructive behavior ruins lives. Yeah, uh, I've had a problem with that, too. As escorts, massage workers, sex workers. Mostly go-go dancers, uh, um, strippers. I mean, some of these kind of involve the other things, but they almost all involve prostitution. Um, and so it does water it down. So, and so it's, it's, it's in the attempt to legitimize it, to say it's, you know, yeah. I mean, that becomes a big political thing, but it is important when you're doing uh, um, analysis and you're saying someone it was an escort. No, they were a prostitute. And that has an effect on who they might have hooked up with. Um, they're making money for what they're doing. So don't don't minimize the, the behaviors there. Um, and you can you can approve of those behaviors if you want to, but they're still the behaviors. So, you know, I have issues with that. Um, so but I think the issue of sex worker becomes more of a political thing. Uh, but in in, in, uh, in crime analysis, we just have to call call it what it is, which is prostitution. So, um, but uh, anyway, I think I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover in this particular case. I think it's a you know it's a very fascinating case, and it's interesting to me they have never come up with a suspect as who could have done this. I will point out that a lot many people think it could be a serial killer. I didn't, I didn't even mention this earlier. Um, I've heard that this you know because there are serial killers that have hit on these mountains. I don't think it's a serial killer. I do not believe that person acted like a serial killer. I don't think that. It's not like she went there alone and was just hiking along and somebody grabbed her and, and sexually assaulted her. None of that happened. You know, she obviously went there with somebody. That's how she got there. Uh, there was no sign of sexual assault. The person panicked and, and, and didn't even take them and buried everything. That's not a serial killer. Uh, as a person with a problem, and I don't know why they've never been able to identify anybody uh, linked to this particular case. Uh, I don't know if it was poor investigating or... They looked in the wrong places, like in Philadelphia, as opposed to Boston. Um, I don't know why it's never been solved or even come close to being solved. Uh, but that doesn't, it's not unlikely that that can happen. So there you go. <laughs> well, you're welcome, Lisa. It is a, it was a crazy, it's a crazy case. I'm glad you found it fascinating too, but it is, it's a really, really interesting case. And, uh, but I, 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 I think she, yeah, wasn't kidnapped. She wasn't killed by a serial killer. She purposely left Philadelphia and somebody helped her leave Philadelphia. I don't believe she took a bus out. So I do believe somebody picked her up and took her to North Carolina and let her drive their vehicle. If that's, you know, she was seen alone in the vehicle and then they, they were friends of some sort, went off to the camping area and she got killed and the person panicked and disappeared. Now, I don't know where they disappeared to, but, you know, it took them five months, mind you, to hear about the gray sedan, to find her body. So, you know, by that time, there's just no, unless a person left, left DNA evidence at the site, which they didn't, there was nothing to, uh, to link the person to that site. Um, and the gray sedan, you know, there's uh, God knows how many gray sedans running around in the world, right? Gray is a very popular color. So could it be any sedan. Um, Unless the person had been at the campsite before, uh, the one that said, you know, turned her away, uh, unless they knew somebody was with her, if they could identify anything, but you know, they're not identifying anybody, uh, you know, that was with her. So it's really, it's a very weird case for that reason. But I say five months had gone by and if they're looking in all the wrong places, they're going to get all the wrong answers. So, and so Annika says, my final verdict is it's a woman. My evidence is the great, great gray sedan, other things, and their family is so tight-lipped. 
you could be right. I, I can't, you know, I, I, there's no reason it could not be a woman. Um, a lot of times I'll say it's not a woman, guys, you know, when we have a sexual homicide and things and, and he, or people come up with some really crazy ideas why a woman was involved and not, the, and not a man. In this case, is it possible? Yes, it is possible. I won't, I won't say it isn't. And it's also possible. Let me think about this. Also possible man and a woman because, because of that, that, that little toy truck thing, if she really, if they really remembered her and I don't know that they did. And, and if the, if she really did buy a toy truck, then there was a kid involved. It might be that she had, she hooked up with somebody who it was a couple. She went with them. Um, and in that, in that case, it is possible. Uh, I have problems with it. Yeah, it doesn't really work for me that she took a ride from Philadelphia with a couple with a kid because it felt safer. But why they would suddenly be going down to North Carolina from wherever she found them doesn't work for me. But so she's with a couple. They all go camping together somewhere and somebody gets they get in an argument. Somebody stabs her and then the husband and wife carry her body. So you got two people. I mean, you can come up with all kinds of scenarios. It's just that's where as, a, as an investigator, you got to go and say, where do we think the whole thing started where she would have had some contact with somebody to get her to North Carolina? Cause as far as we know, she did have to have some way to get there. And where did that come from? Did it come from Philadelphia or did it really come from Boston? So there's a lot of things that I would be interviewing the husband about the relationship, what she had at home was something missing from home. I'd be talking to her friends to find out whether she knew anybody in the area who might be going that direction could be, you know, there's so many questions that have never been answered and have never been brought to light at all. So I have no idea. Um, I wish someone would look into this case now after 25 years, maybe people, her kids or friends will open up. Maybe. I mean, it's not like it's not out there, but nobody's come forward. So I'll say this to the public. Hey, kids, if you want to solve this case of what happened to your mom, you know where I'm at. My husband, the husband has died. I think he died a few years after this happened. So he's no longer around. But yeah, um, you know, I don't know. I'd be willing to look into it some more. So anyway, have a great day, everyone. Great show, Pat. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Um, Molly says, Pat is always great logic on a very illogical case. Having power problems, so need to check that out. <laughs> well, better you have power problems than me, because I'm the whole, the whole show goes to the toilet, you know. <laughs> oh, thank you, Martin. I appreciate that. Hopefully it is an interesting show. That's the whole idea of the the show is to make you think and uh, learn from it. And again, if you're still here at the end of the show and you've never been here before, please do subscribe to the channel, like the video and join Patreon because it makes a difference to have this wonderful community here in the chat room and really, really nice people. <laughs> and, and I always want nice people in my chat room. It's important to me and <laughs> very important to me. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all for being here. And I will probably be seeing you next. Uh, the hangout is uh, the hangout is going to be next. Uh, it'll probably be Wednesday. It'll be a Wednesday hangout this week. Um, uh, probably at 7, 7 p.m. Eastern. And uh, I'm going to be working on the Jack the Ripper issue. Uh, I want to thank Joe again for being on the show for the call in. Uh, I kind of blew it because we were going to talk more about Jack the Ripper. Um, and he was going to give us five suspects. And I forgot we got, or maybe I did it. I got us off subject matter. And we talked about so many interesting things. I didn't get back to it. So I'm going to do a whole Jack the Ripper special. I'm going to give my whole video on my suspect of Jack the Ripper, um, which I did for Mystery Files many years ago. But I've got all my notes from that and all my, my research. I'm going to do my video. But I think I'm going to have a free show for everybody to throw out their suspects and a post show after my video. So we're going to have a whole like Jack the Ripper day. So I think that'll be kind of fun. And I'll get Joe back <laughs> to give his five suspects that I robbed him of saying when I was, uh, when we got off track there. So anyway, so I hope to see you on Wednesday for the hangout. Bye. Bye.